All right, everybody. Recording. Malak Bahama Shah again with you. And uh, this is a Shabbat. I think it's the first Shabbat of the fifth month. Okay. Uh, we uh, last week we observed the feast of wheat harvest. By the way, it looked like I got into a little bit of trouble for about something I said last week. And I'm trying to investigate to see what I said wrong. All right, I said it was hate speech. All right, but I won't go too far into that. But uh, praying that y'all bless this meeting today. Uh, as I said, it's the first Shabbat of the fifth month, and uh, what we got what we got in front of us now is the feast, the feast of uh, uh, trumpets. So, from what I'm seeing, I'm looking from a distance, just glancing, that a lot of these feasts this year will be later on. It won't start off like at the beginning of September. It's going to be somewhere close to October, or in October. All right, but a feast of trumpets is next. And like I said, you know, like we all know <clears throat> that Yah does all his feast days and his uh his his appointments, divine appointments on his feast days that we see in the book of Leviticus and the Torah. Um, you know, he does all all that he does in the earth. When he does something is a by appointment, divine appointment of what you would call more deen. Or more dying, all right? That's just why he made the heavens and the earth. Excuse me, that's just why he made the, uh, the, the lights in the firmament, especially the moon for more dying, for more dying, for appointments. And uh, we gotta basically take heed to it. And one of these days, and I think uh, most of his, uh, his feast, all the way up until Pentecost, uh, Feast of Wheat Harvest, He's done so on. He's done so on Passover. He started in Egypt with the Passover thing before he even gave the, the commandments to Torah. And then he uh, would be Hawashai. He fulfilled uh, Passover on the first first month, 14th day. He for, excuse me, he fulfilled the feast of uh, uh, of unleavened bread. The next the next day was the first day of the feast of unleavened bread on the 15th of Abib. All the way to the 22nd. And then he fulfilled uh, the feast of uh, first fruits, uh, which is the, the day right after the first day of the uh, feast of uh, bread. All right, the feast of first fruits, he fulfilled that. And then he fulfilled with, with the feast of wheat harvest. He fulfilled the uh, wheat harvest, uh, uh, first fruit of wheat harvest, as a matter of fact. He fulfilled that with uh, the Holy Ghost. Baptizing, filling the disciples up with the Holy Ghost on that day, which was commemorated last week. Okay, but what is he going to do on the next holy day? Well, he done all of those in order two thousand years ago. But what is he going to do next? It looks like either he's going to start off again with a uh, feast of wheat harvest. That's kind of, I still kind of so expect something to happen on wheat harvest because of. Daniel's prophecy in uh, Daniel chapter two, that uh, the, 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 that the image that was smote on the foot with the rock, with the stone cut out without hands, that it failed and that it was, uh, that it was ground to powder and, and it, it, the, uh, the wind carried away the chaff of that image. Like the uh, chaff, of the, excuse me, like the chaff at the summer threshing floor. So on the, in the summer is where you have a wheat harvest what they call Pentecost. And it's symbolized by wheat and beating wheat, you know, beating the chaff of a wheat, in which all of us that believe in, that are in the Yahweh Shai symbolize wheat. The fake ones symbolize the tares, if you know, if you know the scripture. But on the wheat harvest, it's different from the, from the barley. Barley and wheat look alike. But barley, you don't have to beat it in order to get the chaff of it. But we, you had to take it through tribulation, all right? Take it through tribulation in order to get the chaff off, in order to make it 
ready for baking bread and breaking products to grind it to make whatever you're going to make out of it. All right. Uh, but we see that when the stone that was cut out with our hands smote the image on the feet of Daniel chapter two, that the, that the iron, the brass, the, uh, the, 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 with the silver and the gold was ground together. All right. And, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor of the wind carried it away. Okay. So I kind of still a little bit have a little uh, reservation that y'all might start again with uh, the Feast of Wheat Harvest, or he might just go ahead and start with uh, the Feast of Trumpets. All right. With the Feast of Trumpets, we see that in the scriptures. Okay. Well, he could start on the Feast of Trumpets and basically bring his kingdom. Because the next thing that he's going to do on the earth is going to bring the kingdom. So either it's going to be with Feast of Wheat Harvest or it's going to be with Feast of Trumpets or both. He might destroy the nations with Feast of Wheat Harvest. As we saw the image represent the kingdoms of the earth all the way to the end in Daniel, Daniel chapter two. And then he might come or he might ascend like you know we heard all right, like the scripture says in, in Psalm chapter 47, God is going up with a child, Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. All right, so but I want to talk to you a little bit today about some more stuff, some more, not stuff, but some more things that Yah has for me to talk to, talk to you about. But as you know, he wants me to talk to you about, um, about him. All right, you know, we have a lot of, we can talk about a lot of things as believers in Yahweh and my Hamashiach. All right, we can talk about a lot of things: being born again, being filled with the Spirit, baptisms, and the second coming of Yahweh Shai. But Yahweh, he's he's anointed me with the Holy Spirit uh, in 1984, and showed me what he wanted me to talk about right there. All right, he wanted me to talk about him, about Yahweh. All right, specifically. You know, he don't want me to, he wants me to talk about him, Yahweh himself, the most high, El Elyon. All right. And that, I have to admit, I have to confess that when I got off into talking, every now and then he allows me to talk about some of the elementary principles. But this kingdom that's coming is mainly about the mature believer. And the mature believer is going to be ready to receive the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is going to have a king. All right. The kingdom of God. Now, when Israel was reigning thousands of years ago, the David, it was called the kingdom of Israel. But we see this new kingdom that's coming that's going to take over Esau, Edom's, Edomite's kingdom. All right. That's going to take over Idumea, you know, as we know in the book of uh, uh, Ezra. Uh, Esau's the end of the world that now is, but Jacob is the beginning of that which comes after. This kingdom that's coming is Yahweh's kingdom. All right. And uh, it's not the same as the kingdom that was on the earth that was, that was of Israel with David, David and Solomon reign. This one is going to have Yahweh himself reigning over this kingdom. All right. This one's going to have Yahweh himself reigning over his kingdom. So we want to talk some more on this because. You can never stop talking. You, you can never have enough of talking about Yahweh reigning because all of the scriptures is leaning toward that end. Now we know that Yahweh Shai comes after the ancient of days and reigns, right? And he has a Melchizedek kingdom, all right, which basically is a king priest, Malachi, which you know, which comes from the word Malach, Malachi, which has to do with king. All right, my name is Malach Ba Mashai. Um, a royal son of, of David, uh, not David, royal son of Moses, all right? All right, that's my name, but Malki, which means uh, king or royal, and Kezadak means priest. So we know that the ring, that the major priest that's, that's going to be installed again whenever this kingdom happens again is the Zadok, Zadok, Zadok priesthood, which was the son of Aaron, all right? He was the one that won out in his, in his kingdom, his priesthood, his family was faithful. All right. But uh, but Yahweh's kingdom was going to be a Mel Melchizedek 
kingdom. All right, he's going to be priest. That's going to be a temple built again um, for that kingdom. All right, and there's going to be another king, uh, temple built. And uh, there's going to be two thrones. All right, or oh, excuse me, one throne, one the throne of the of Yahweh and the throne of the Lamb. All right. So basically, Yahweh and his and, and the Melchizedek priest is going to reign. All right. So there's going to be a king and a priest reign. Now, I do think it's, I do think we, uh, we as a as the body of Yahweh Shai, worldwide, especially those Hebrew Israelites, our Hebrew Israelite people, we downplay Yahweh coming to reign. All right, we, we downplay it, but we look toward, we look forward to Yahweh Shai. All right. But uh, but even Yahweh Shai was looking forward to Yahweh reigning upon the earth. All right. So let's go, let's let's go to some of these scriptures that deal with Yahweh coming to reign as a king. All right. As a king, he's coming to reign. It's, I just brought up a scripture that reminds me. The reason I don't write out my own my my what I'm gonna teach, because the spirit might take me somewhere else after I wrote out a whole thing I'm gonna teach on the spirit take me somewhere else. And it'd be far much better than what I wrote out. But let's go to song real quick. That same uh, psalm that I just spoke about, uh, Yahweh, Allah Haim was going up with a shout, Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. So let's go to Psalm 47. And you look at some of these psalms, what we'll find out is that uh, a lot of these psalms are talking about this reign of God. David, this is this is a psalm of Korah, of the sons of Korah, but even David spoke about uh, Yahweh coming down the rain. His son Solomon spoke about it. All right, so this kingdom that's coming is Yahweh's kingdom. All right. And his son is going to be a Melchizedek priest. All right, but we don't see this in the teachings that we uh, that we encounter worldwide. Even the Gentiles are teaching that Yahweh is coming back. But by the time Yahweh ascends and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, like the angels said in Acts chapter two or Acts chapter one, by the time he returns, Yahweh is going to be already on the earth as the Ancient of Days. It's going to be an already took out all of the opposing uh, kingdoms. So when Yahushai gets back on the earth, he's not gonna really have to fight for to the other nations for the kingdom. Yahweh himself is gonna be and already knocked him down. All right, but we see Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For Yahweh most high is terrible. All right, so what's going on here? The sons of Korah are seeing this in vision. They're prophets, they're uh, basically, I think they're Levites, the sons of Korah. For, the, for Yahweh Most High is terrible. Let's take a look at this, Yahweh Most High is El Elyon. So whenever you see Most High, it's not talking about anybody else but the Most High, the one that sits on the throne up in heaven, all right? And uh, sometimes our brothers and we take the position that Yahweh is gonna do this from heaven and that the son do whatever he's going to do on the earth. But I, no, that's not what the Bible's saying. Most high is El Elyon, as you can see right here. Let's see here. El Elyon is really right here, but it's showing you how to say it right there. It's, it's elevation. It's Hebrew 59.45, excuse me. It's uh, an elevation that is objectively lofty, comparably as titled the supreme, most <laughs> the supreme. Let me let me highlight this uh, so you can see it. As the title, the supreme, most on. 
All right, I'm gonna have to hold on just a moment. Okay, so again, Hebrew 59.45 is a title of the Supreme. So when it's talking about Yahweh Most High is terrible, how is he terrible? What's going on here in this song? All right, so but it's talking about the Most High, I highlighted that. Most on high, upper most. Upper most, let me highlight that real quick just by itself. Uh -oh. So there's many gods. All right, even the angels are called Allah Hayyam in heaven. All right, but right here, it's saying that this one that, that it's talking about is the upper most, the one that sits on the throne, all right? So Yahweh most high is terrible. Look at this word terrible, Hebrew 33, 72. So he's terrible, all right? Get Charles Bakri to say that word terrible for you. He's very famous for saying that terrible. Hebrews 3372, Yare. It's a primitive root, it means to fear, morally to revere, causally to frighten. All right, so this God that's in heaven is terrible. That means he will frighten you to a fright. Let's, let's highlight that. This is why you want to get yourself right before, you know, while you're young. Solomon said, know thy creator in the days of thy youth, before the evil days say in which you will have no pleasure in them. I mean, before you get old, don't wait till you get old knowing, you know, you ain't gonna have enough strength to know him then. Means to frighten, to affright, to make afraid. All right, let me highlight this. To make, a, to be, make afraid, dreadful, to put in fear. And this, you know, I'm highlighting this, you know, sometimes we read through the scriptures, we, 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 we reading and we understanding another language other than what our forefathers knew, all right? That our Hebrew forefathers um, spoke Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, you can see this, it means to put in fear, fearful, fearfully fearing. And, he, and basically he's to be had in reverence and terrible, terrible acting. Terrible actness. Let's go down here at the bottom right here. Terrible actness. That means this God that's in heaven. All right. It's Yahweh, the most high. He's terrible in his acting and what he does. All right. Now, uh, let me tell you that this God is omni, all powerful, omnipresent, all omniscient. That means he's all knowing. Omnipresent, that means he's everywhere. And he's almighty, he's all powerful. There's nothing much stronger than him. It says in verse two, he is great. He is a great king of all the earth. So right here is telling us, let me highlight that. Right here is telling us that they're seeing him, the sons of Korah that wrote this song, are seeing the future. They was thousands of years ago, 3,000, somewhere around 3,000 years ago. But they wrote this psalm because they're seeing what he's doing, that he's in the future. And they're seeing him in the future, that he's a great king of all the earth. So right here is telling us that this great king that's coming is going to be reigning in the earth. See that? He is a great king over all the earth, not just from heaven over there. He's going to be in the earth. Okay. A great king, let's look at this word great, 14, 19 in the Hebrew. Gado, Gado, great, hence older. And we see that he's called the ancient of days, right? He's great in any sense. Right here it says hence, basically it's another way of saying also older. 
So these are ancient of days. So right here it says he's older. So he's going to be definitely older than Yahawashai. Yahawashai ended his life at 33 years of age. So he'll be 33 when he comes back. But this, this, this God that's going to be in the earth, it's going to be older. Also insolent. Uh, a loud elder. Let's look at that word elder. He's going to be elder. All right, elder, eldest, exceedingly, exceedingly far, men of great matter, thing, thinger, thingness, high, long, loud, mighty, much more noble, proud thing. So this God, let me tell you a little bit about him. What we've already seen in scriptures I've gone over before, and which we probably will go over again in a little bit here, that when we see Paul talking about this, this, you know, about this kingdom that's coming, the kingdom of God, Paul is often alluding to what's going to happen with this person. He's going to be king. Let me highlight the word king. But when he comes into the world, Yahweh talked about that he would be also called the son of man. When Yahushua came into the earth, he was basically representing his father as a king. And he was the express image of the invisible God. He's, just, he's, he's the image of the invisible God. So what Yahushua looks like, it's going to be kind of how this guy looks. All right? But Paul and the New Testament writers are talking about his kingdom. It's not going to be like David's. This kingdom is going to last forever, all right? David's kingdom eventually ended, and if you, and after Solomon, it, it drizzled out. It was a great kingdom. Don't get me wrong. But this king right here is going to put an end to everything, every other kingdom, all right? Because he's the creator, all right? Now, how this king is going to do all of this, and how he's going to be king over there, is really amazing, all right? And what we see in the scriptures. And that's just amazing by itself. You will rejoice because once our people get this, the ones that are really are studying, they got, oh my goodness. All right. They talk about what, you know, what they think Yahweh Shai is going to do. But all those prophecies, what, Yah, what, the, what the king is going to do to the other nations is to talk about this person right here. All right. So the warfare that the nations have over, over Israel is not just trying to stop Israel. Is trying to stop this king right here. And it's, it's more than about Yahweh Shai. Not trying to stop Yahweh Shai. They, they crucified him and he rose from the dead and went to heaven and is on the right hand of the Father. But they're trying to stop this king right here. All right? And this king is not Yahweh Shai. The reason why they, how they're trying to stop him, they're trying to stop him from coming into the earth. That's the reason why you see things like abortion and stuff in, the, in certain communities. Because these certain communities where they abortion and killing children are raining, was raining, has to do with this community that this king is going to come out of. And yes, I said he's going to be born into the earth. So Yahweh Shai basically was a prophecy. His whole life was a prophecy about his father. He basically came into the earth to make, make the way plain, kind of like John the Baptist, to make the, make the path straight for the Lord, for Yahweh. All right, when, you, when your house came up to John the Baptist to be baptized, John saw him and said, Whoa, oh, the, the, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He told him, He said, I need to be baptized of you, and you coming to me? And how was I said, Suffer to be so for now, John, for, the, for it to come of us to fulfill all righteousness. So, in another place in the scripture, it says that Yahweh is the forerunner, calls him a forerunner, which John the Baptist was a forerunner of his coming. Yahweh is the forerunner of Gesu. Of Yahweh. Yahweh Shai is the forerunner of his father. So Yahweh Shai's life prophesied about this king. Okay? When they say, when the heathen, they come up with the virgin birth doctrine, say that Yahweh Shai was born of a, of a miracle, then if he was, then this king right here would have to be born of a miracle. And nowhere does it say that. Basically, or an angel put the seed in the virgin's womb and she got pregnant, all right? No, it doesn't say that. This king right here will be born from Israel. 
All right. As a matter of fact, when the woman sinned and she ate of the fruit and Adam ate also, when Yahweh pronounced judgment on everybody for it, he told the serpent that he would put enmity between him, her seed, the woman's seed, and his seed. His seed will, will his seed will bruise the heel of the woman's seed, but the woman's seed will crush his head, will crush the serpent's head, the seed of the serpent's head. The end of this is basically that Yahweh himself comes down and dwells in the earth and he's born just like anybody else. And I think that's how Yahweh shot. And it's obvious that that's how Yahweh was born. He's born of a woman, born of a, of a woman that had sex for the first time with, with her spouse husband. And she, and she got pregnant, all right? She got pregnant and the scriptures, the way it's written, the way it looks like, the way they have translated it from the other languages. It looks like she was born, the baby Yahweh was born of a virgin. That was miraculous, all right? But uh, if you study it and you look over that story really good, you'll come to the conclusion that, Yah that Joseph was really Yahweh father. But in the spirit, Yahweh was the son of God. All right? So he's, this, this Yahweh is going to be king of all earth. He's Yahweh most high. Let's go to verse three. He shall subdue the people under us and the nation under our feet. All right? Did it say that Yahweh was going to do it or the Lord most high? It's saying that Yahweh Most High is going to subdue the people under our people. We're talking about the nations that have oppressed us, all right? He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. Now look at this right here. Verse 5. Let me highlight it for you. Allah Hayyam, or God, is going up with a shout. What is he going up to? What, is, what happened? All right, he's going up with a shout. So let's look at this word going up and look at it again. 59, 27 in the Hebrew. One of the, one of the word meanings of it and the first meaning of it, it means to ascend. Some people say, oh, that's Jesus, but wait a minute. We're talking about the one that's gonna reign and it says that he's Yahweh most high. He's, he's the king of all the earth. And these, this, this, uh, these sons of Korah that wrote this song <clears throat> did not say that he's going to be Yahweh's son. It's saying that he's the most high. Yahweh is the most high that's going to be reigning over the earth. To ascend and transitive and transitively to be high or active mountain used in a great variety of senses, primary, secondary, literally and figuratively, rise up, calls to ascend up. There it is again. Meaning it means to ascend up. That means he's going to be in the earth. All right. So Yahweh Shai says something that kind of is a hint to this thing right here because this person is hidden. The scriptures in Psalm in Isaiah 49 says he will be hidden. All right. He will not be out on the street. He will not cause his voice to be heard in the street. He will be hidden. All right. But right here, this word going up is which is all, all law, all law. 59.27 in the Hebrew means to ascend up. All right. And Yahweh I said that uh, there's coming a day you're going to want to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Was he talking about himself or was he talking about another Son of Man? I think he's talking about another Son of Man. This Son of Man right here. The one that comes in the latter days, which is really going to turn out to be Yahweh most high. So Allah or God is going up with a shout. Now let's look at this word Hebrew 86 to 47 with a shout. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go into this. How is this man gonna be? All right, 86, 43 in the Hebrew. Teruah. And right here, this word teruah basically is symbolizing the next feast that's coming coming up, the next feast of the Hebrew Torah that's coming. And remember, Yah does all his works on these feast days. See? True. So the real when the feast of trumpets happen, it, it, it's gonna happen with Yahweh himself. Not with Yahweh Shai. Yahweh's already Yahweh Shai is already going up. He sat at the right hand of the Father until it's time for him to come back. But right here, the next feast has to do with Teruah. Has to do with somebody that's called Allah or God going up, ascending up. All right. 
He's going up with a Teruah. So the next piece is called the Feast of Trumpets, which is the Feast of Teruah. That, that's the literal name of that next piece, which we call the Trumpets. But the scripture calls it the Feast of Teruah. The same way, and I don't think the, real, the, the Paleo Hebrew, which is the original Hebrew, says Teruah. I think it's Terah. 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 Ah. Terah. Ah. How you will say that, Terah. Feast of Terah. Ah. But we'll say Teruah so we can distinctively understand it to get it into our heads. All right, so it means to clap, the clamor, that is exclamation of joy or battle cry. I wanna highlight this right here. It says battle cry because Yahweh is coming down to fight. Uh-huh. So this king is coming for battle. All right. Kind of reminds you like Solomon and David. Solomon was a man of man of peace. He was not a man of war and battle. But David, guess what he was? He was a man of battle. He's the one that secured the kingdom for, for his son Solomon to reign. You kind of see this happening with Yahweh himself, that he's coming to fight and he's going to secure the kingdom so his son Yahweh Shai can come back and become Melchizedek and be our Melchizedek priest and king so that the whole house of so that Israel can reign over the earth. All right? Like I just said, he should subdue the people under, under us, uh, the nations under our feet, right? In verse three, I think that's what it says. All right? So it says battle cry. So this word Teruah, which means shouting, <clears throat> which means shouting. And this those same word for the Feast of, of Trumpets, Feast of Teruah. So it's a battle cry, especially clangor of trumpets, see, of, of trumpets. Let me highlight that. Could Yahweh be on his way to, to send up on trumpets? Because what is what's gonna happen is he's gonna be in the earth. All right. He's gonna be in the earth and he's gonna go through a certain amount of sufferings. Kind of reminds you a little bit of Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai went through some sufferings, died on the cross and rose again. His father, the father is gonna be rejected and gonna go through a lot of, he's gonna suffer many things, all right? But instead of basically him dying like the son did, he's gonna basically be renewed, gonna, gonna resur not resurrect, but he's gonna become. What is he gonna become? He's gonna become a quickening spirit, all right? He's not gonna die, he's gonna live forever, all right? And when that happens, he's gonna go up with a shout, with a battle cry, defeat them, and I guarantee you, it would have to be on the Feast of Trumpets, all right? Clangor of trumpets as of a, an alarm. What is that, alarm? Yeah, alarm, right there. It says, I don't know how, to, how they, what they were trying to do, but I think he was trying to say this word, alarm, alarm. So the trumpets, the trumpets on the Feast of Trumpets is this man right here ascending up to heaven, alarm. That's probably the Hebrew way of saying alarm, alarm. Right here, it says it in that in English way, alarm. Blowing of the trumpets, all right? Blowing of the trumpets. Right here, there's the word jubil. Without jubilee, because if it had another E at the end of it, it'd be jubilee, but it said jubil. So you know it has something to do with jubilee. So the trump, the, so, the, so, the, so the jubilee, Israel's Jubilee, where they all go back to their land, everybody goes back. Basically, it's going to happen with Yahweh himself ascending. You know, the funny thing about it is nobody's talking about this. I say this all the time. Nobody's talking about Yahweh himself. All right. And whenever I get on another topic, instead of on this topic about Yahweh, I feel the, the disapproval of Yahweh. All right. So he basically uh, anointed me when I was filled with the Holy Spirit in 84 to talk about this and I studied for years because I wanted to be sure I was teaching the right thing. And that's how many years is that? 1984, this is, we're going up on 2024. That's about 40 years, right? So basically this, this, this king that's coming is Yahweh himself. Now remember, Yahweh is omnipresent, omnipotent. That means omnipotent, all powerful, omniscient. It means he's all knowing. He's omnipresent, that means he's, there's no place that he, he's not at, all right? 
I mean, even in time, time is, I was just talking to my son a little bit ago, we was in the discussion. Time for him, he created time. So he's in the past, present, and future, all right? Loud noise, right? Loud noise is another thing for Teruah. Rejoicing, shouting, all right? So basically, Feast of Trumpets has to do with, it's like a feast of shouting. And when you shout, do you see people in church shouting? They shout because they're happy, a shout of joy, all right? Let me highlight this real quick. Shouting, shouts of joy, because of joy, high, joyful, joyful sounding. So what is he gonna bring? He's gonna bring, he's gonna bring Israel to a, how can I put it? He's gonna bring Israel to a position that's never, that they're never gonna lose, all right? And we highly understand what's gonna happen, but I'm trying to explain it. He's gonna bring Israel to a, to a climax, all right? That they're, they're, they're gonna, that's gonna last forever, all right? You, you know, a good, a good movie, we have the the you know the beginning of the movie, the plot, you know, and all of that stuff. And at the end is a climax to the movie. A good movie has a good climax, you know, along with the the plot and the, the all of the stuff that goes on and at the beginning of the movie. The climax is what makes the movie great. If it's a great movie, all right. But he's gonna bring Israel to a, a great pitch. Uh, shot and that's what the Feast of Trumpets is all about. And that's the next feast of Israel. Uh, we're in the fifth month. This Feast of Trumpets or Feast of Shouting happens in the seventh Hebrew month. So it's another two months, all right? Or less than two months, all right? All right, so God is going up right here with a shout, with a teruah, all right? And we see this too, that, uh, that, the, that the seventh trumpet, when the seventh trumpet sounds, all right, that's this teruah. This that's what this symbolizes right here. The seven trumpets. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. All right, Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. He's going up. All right, so he ascends, and we see this in Revelation chapter twelve, when the woman gives birth to a to a man child. You know, and the dragon wants to devour this child before it's you know right as it's born. It's a man child, but you have to think about it. Not just a child, it's a man child. A man child. And you see Isaiah 66 talking about this man child. All right. And this man child basically has to be not just a child, he's a man. But when he when he's ready for his purpose, he ascends up. We see this, you see this woman giving birth to a man child in Revelation 12. All right. And that woman has happens to be Israel, Zion. All right. Symbolically giving birth to this child. Or a man child. And a child was caught up into God into his throne. All right. And after that child is caught up, we'll go over it in a second or two. There's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And the dragon was kicked out of heaven. All right. After that man child send it up. So he's going up for war. So he's coming down here, but when he conquers down here, he conquers all that Satan threw at him. Because he's gonna he's gonna go through some stuff. He's gonna fight, have a spiritual war down here. When that happens, he's gonna be he's gonna become right. And that's 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 the word used by the word in in Exodus chapter three of uh, Haya. Haya basically in Hebrew means to become. All right. In the Greek, it's uh, uh what's that word Drake in the Greek? Uh, to become. Uh, I'll go there in a second or two. But there's two words, and there's one in Hebrew, one in the Greek, to become. Whenever you see that word, Yahweh, it's connected onto Yahweh becoming. Even it's connected onto the, to the, uh, to, uh, what is it, the Antichrist, the man of sin. Only now he who will let, he who lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Basically, the man of sin is already working, all right? He's already doing his job. The only thing about this man of sin, I'm gonna tell you this, the man of sin don't want Yahweh to come. So what he wants to do is to keep us in a lukewarm state, a state where Yahweh's not coming, in the state where he's not, he's not basically having to do a lot of damage. 
That means the Antichrist, if the more damage he does, is that, that's showing that, it, that his time is short. So he wants to keep us in a lukewarm state. All right? Only now he who lets will let until he be taken out of the way. We'll look at that too. Sing praises to God. Sing praises, sing praises to our, unto our king. Remember, who is the king? It's Yahweh Most High. All right? So he's not talking right here about Yahweh Shai exactly. All right? Not exactly he's talking about Yahweh Shai. He's talking about the king, Yahweh Most High, in verse 2 of Psalm 47. For God is the king of, of all the earth. Can you highlight that? Yeah, well, he's up in heaven reigning over there. Okay, y'all get him. Yeah, I wish I was down here. No, it's talking about this God. Yeah. Hold on just a moment. Let me highlight this. God reigning above. Well, okay, now I'm at the wrong scripture. But God is king of all the earth. See that? God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praise of our understanding. Let's come down here. God reigneth over the heathen. So who's going to be reigning over the heathen? This God most high. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God, he is greatly exalted. So what are we waiting on? We're waiting on God, God himself, all right? That's what we're waiting on. Let me show you something real quick from the, from the conversation my son and I had a little earlier. So most people don't realize what's coming. What's coming is far much more than what we think. Like the Queen of Sheba told Solomon, the half had not been told her till she heard about his, his, his glory. We have not heard the half or understood the half of what's going to happen, what Yah is going to do in the world for his people. Like, like the apostle said, I have not seen nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things Yah has prepared for those that love him. That means the people that's going to reign with him in this kingdom. You know? They're going to be greatly rewarded, rewarded. Let's see. And the Solomon now is building the kingdom, building the house of Yahweh. First Kings 8, 22. And Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, Yahweh Allah of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Who has kept, who has kept with thy servant David, my father, who has kept with my servant, with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him. Thou speakest also with thy mouth and has filled it, has fulfilled it with thy hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Yahweh of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in thy sight, in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that the children take heed to their way that they walk before me as thou hast, as thou hast walked before me. Tell them, David, as you walk before me, that shall not fail thee a child, one of your seed, to sit upon the throne of the king. Now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, as thou speakest unto David, thy, David my father. But, God, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Look at this. I have to look at that from the Bible study. I was just happened before we got online, before I got online. Look at this. But will God indeed, let me highlight this really good. I might just highlight the whole thing to get it. <laughs> Excuse me. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Question mark. Why did Solomon say that? Because Solomon's building the house of Yahweh. This is what David's purpose was when he, when he got the temple ready for, for his son Solomon to build it. David wanted to build it, but David said he wanted to build Yahweh a house. All right, he wanted to build Yahweh a house. So, so Solomon's got done building this house. But then Solomon says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Watch this. 
Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain you. I must bless this house that I have built. Y'all see that? Let me read that again. Behold, the heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built? So he's sitting around wondering, how is Yahweh going to dwell in this house when the heavens and heavens of heavens cannot even contain him? That means, Yah like we was talking about a little earlier, my son and I, how Yahweh is omnipresent. Omnipresent, that means he's everywhere at the same time. All right? The heaven and heaven and heavens cannot contain. How is he going to dwell in this house? All right? And so we know from the Bible study we already had that Yah himself is going to come down and going to dwell with his people. But remember, the heavens and heavens of heaven cannot contain him. So how is this house going to contain him? All right? That's what Solomon is asking. Obviously, we just saw, we just saw in the scriptures that Yah is reigning in the earth in the latter days. And that kingdom that's to come is really his. You know, that's the reason why Yahweh Shai prayed the prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Watch this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Did Yahweh Shai say my kingdom come or his kingdom come? Yahweh, the Father in heaven's kingdom come, his will be done in earth as it is in heaven. All right? But thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So this kingdom is Yahweh's kingdom, not the son of Yahweh's kingdom is Yahweh's kingdom. All right? I'm not saying that Yahweh Shai won't reign, the son won't reign, as he will be a Mechizedek priest, as we see in Psalm 110. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna reign forever as a Mechizedek priest. But this guy right here, that's really something else. And I, I you know, I, I, I speak a lot of quote, you know, a lot of sayings and uh, Ebonic colloquialisms and all of that. This God is a trip, all right? The God that's coming to reign, he's a trip. He's, he's a bad man, all right? You, you think you, how wish I was on us? This one right here, now, now the major thing about this guy, he's to be feared because really this God that we see that's coming to reign on the earth, all right, in the latter days along with his son, this God does good and he can do evil. You heard me right. He does good. And he can do evil. Now, I don't want to, you know, leave off of where I'm at. I might go there a little later to show you that he's a God that does good and creates evil. You probably already read it. You're real advanced in the scriptures. You've already read that in the book of Isaiah, that he does good and creates evil. Creates good. He does good and creates evil. All right. He does whatever he wants to do. Believe it or not, he does whatever he wants to do. And there's no law against him because he's the one that created law. He created everything, all right? You can't take his existence from him. You know, we know that the, that the adversary wants to take his existence from him because believe it or not, this man that really is Yahweh himself, it's gonna be manifested in the earth. And that's the reason why we see in Revelation, I'm gonna go there real quick in a second or two, but I wanna read the rest of this. That's the reason why we see the dragon, which is the devil and Satan, standing before the woman, which is to give birth, trying to devour her child as soon as he was born. We're gonna go there. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? That's what Solomon said. Yes, that's a question for you to for you to for you to answer. Either he's going to dwell on the earth, yes or no. I'm telling you, yes, he's going to dwell on the earth. Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain thee. The heavens and heaven, to whom the heaven and the heaven and heaven cannot contain, he's going to dwell on the earth in a person that's basically a, like a human being. But he will be a, a, a quickening spirit. So if the spirit person because he's going to be in the flesh, and then he's going to become a quickening spirit. All right. As you see in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, he has a garment on white as snow. Here of his head like pure wool. And he's sitting. He's sitting. All right. We see that in Revelation chapter 4. You know, John goes up to heaven, the voice says, Come up hither. He saw a throne, and the one that sat on him had, had a color, jasper, sardine, stone color. All right, sitting on the throne up in heaven around four and 20 elders, they would bow down and worship him, serve him and all of that around him. All right, the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit, the seven lamps stands of God standing before him. That's this person right here. All right. So the heaven and heaven and heaven cannot contain it. It means he's everywhere. How much less this house that I build it? All right. 
So let's go there real quick. So the good God indeed dwell on earth, yes. Yeah, Solomon's sitting around questioning. I'm built, I built this house for you for Yahweh, but will he will he dwell on the earth? That's the question. That is the question. All right, will Yahweh, you know, to be not to be is not the question. Is will Yahweh will Allah Hayam dwell on the earth is the question. Okay. And the heaven and heaven and heavens cannot contain. Can I can I do anything with it? He's everywhere. But will he dwell on the earth and dwell in that house that Solomon built? And let's go here real quick, Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. But we know that this woman represents Israel. How do you know? Because she's a woman clothed with the sun. All right. The moon under her feet. So Yah's feast days have to do with the sun and the moon. And upon her, he had a crown of 12 stars. 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Let me highlight that for you real quick. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Let me go up a little further. And there appeared another one in heaven and behold, a great red dragon. You notice it said red dragon. You know where did that red from? From Edom. From Esau that was born red all over here, like a red hairy garment. This has to do with Rome. I'm gonna highlight this too, real quick. Because Rome, if you look in any dictionary, most of the scholarly dictionary says that Rome was one of Edom's nations. Rome was descended out from Edom. All right. There appeared another one in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And those the crowns on the head, all right? This woman basically is pregnant. What is she, what is she pregnant with? She's travailing in birth and, birth and pain to be delivered. We see Israel, and I'm gonna I'm a sidebar on this. We see Israel scattered among the nations going through a lot of tribulation. They've been enslaved, Jim Crow. Um, you know, problems with oppression. Nations not want to give them reparations for the things they suffered unlawfully and uncivilizedly. Not want to give uh, reparations to them. They give reparations to other nations that have gone through less than what these people have gone through. But these people are still going through their sufferings as long as they don't get reparations. They still are being pain and pain to be delivered. The way pain to be delivered means basically pain to be delivered. It means to get out of that mess, you know? <laughs> She's travailing in birth and pain to be rescued. All right, pain to be delivered. There appeared another one in heaven, the Holy Great Rear Dragon. We just read that. And he has seven heads and ten horns. He had seven crowns upon his head. That means this, this being, this creature, and whoever these people are reigning, they got crowns on their head. All right, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth. All right, the third part of the stars of heaven. And did cast them to the earth. This might have something to do with, you know, when we talk about the two thirds not being destroyed in the latter day, two thirds of Israel, this, this is a third of the stars were being cast to the earth. That means they're going to go through a lot of tribulation. The third is going to make it through the fire, going to make it through the tribulation. The dragon basically slammed them to the earth. All right. That means the dragon was reigning up in the heavens, not Israel. Third of the stars was Israel. The ones that's going to be redeemed. All right. And, and the dragon stood before the woman, which is Israel, which was ready to be delivered to, for the devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, a lot of people say this happened already. What I say is that the prophecy happened already. Just like Yahweh what was going to happen with him was, uh, was, was prophesied through Moses, where Pharaoh tried to kill the deliverer before he, was, before he could even grow up. By having Israel, the women, the women, throw their children into the to the river to be devoured of crocodiles. All right, and Miriam, um, excuse me, not Miriam, but Moses' mother saw, and her parents, Moses' parents saw that he was a beautiful child and a special child. Basically, kept him until they couldn't keep him no more, and put him in an ark, and then floated him down the Nile to where Pharaoh's daughter was. And we know the story. We watch the Ten Commandments every year. 
around the time of Easter or Passover, we know the story, except that the colors of the people might be a little different. All right. <laughs> but but, but, the, but the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered to devour a child as soon as it was born. So what happened with Moses prophesied about Yahweh Shai. All right. Remember what happened with Yahweh Shai, the wise, the wise men came from, ba from Babylon, from the Orient, wanted to know where is he that was born king of the Jews. Because we've seen a star in the east and come, come to worship him. And Herod, who was basically an Edomite king, was set there because he was the same, he was of the same people that, that Rome was. All right. He was set over Israel, these Negro Israelites. He was set over them. All right. He basically didn't like to hear that. He basically said, go and find a child. When you found him, let me know where he's at so I can go and worship him too. Really, he was wanting to come and kill him. Because he basically was saying, this, this child is a, is, a, is a rival to my throne. All right. So, yeah, so Moses' Moses's life prophesied of Yahweh. All right. And we know what happened here. He killed, sent, sent uh, his forces there to Bethlehem where the child was born. And killed every child two years old and under because the wise man was warned of God to not go back and tell Herod where the child was. Meanwhile, Yah told Joseph to go and take the child and his mother into Egypt. All right, so Moses' life kind of similarly, you know, went through the same thing. Where the dragon, even back then, knew that they knew about the deliverer that was coming in Egypt and tried to kill the 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 born, the, the child, the baby boy, that that would be, and almost did it, you know? But Yah had it protected, and we saw what happened with Yahweh Shai's life, with where here it tried to kill Yahweh Shai, the son of God, before he, would, before he can make it up to adulthood. But we see right here in this story that Yahweh Shai's life is prophesying about the father that's coming into the world, all right? Except this child, basically, is going to be a man child, as we see right here. Let me highlight that. That means he will be a man. All right. So he's going to be in the midst of the abortion clinics. He'd be a man. He probably figured, figured out, we're trying to kill somebody that's a man probably by now. So let's get rid of this abortion stuff. All right. So he's going to be a man child. A man child. You might say, what, what is that? But he, for one thing, he's a man. He's a child in his purpose. Now, when they was asking Yahweh Shai, who was the greatest in the kingdom, I think in Matthew chapter 18, he took the, his disciples to the side and showed them a child, made a child sit in their midst. And he, and he, he said, whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, all right? The same as the, the, same as the greatest in the kingdom. He's not talking about just the children are the greatest because all children, will, most children will humble themselves to adult leadership. He's talking about whatever man, whatever man would humble himself as that little child, as if he's a little child for the sake of the kingdom, the same as the greatest in the kingdom. All right? So this man child basically is gonna be somebody that humbles. And really, they, remember the conversation was about who's the greatest in the kingdom. All right, so the greatest in the kingdom, you already know, is the king. Greatest in the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God, is the king, which is God. So that right here is telling you that this, this man that's going to be Yahweh himself is going to be like a child. And that's why Yahweh Shai said, whosoever receiveth one such child, in my name receiveth me. And remember, Yahweh Shai was, is the express image of him, of the father. I mean, he's the image of the invisible God. So whosoever received the one such child received Yahweh. Okay. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now here's the here's the key, here's the punchline right here. Why was the dragon trying to get the hold of this child? And it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about somebody in the future. Because when you look at Revelation, it says that these things that are, are, are at hand to come. So everything that happened in the book of Revelation is not something that just happened already. It's in the future to happen. All right? And I, I'll go there later. 
when it says these things are yet to come, for to come. But here's the punchline right here. That child was caught up unto God. When we see this, oh, that's Jesus. He was caught up to the right hand of God. No, no, that's not Jesus. And that child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That means her child was caught up to being God. See that? Her child was caught up to being God and to God's throne. That means this is the one that sits on the throne. <laughs> I'm telling you, a lot of people can't see this. You'll be right over it. It's not, and a lot of the time, it's not meant for some people to see this. But if you see this and you understand it, there's a reward for you. Because you understand that Yah is coming down. And he's gonna be among you, he's gonna be among his people. What if you run into this person? All right. What if you run into him? You know, like I said, it's not meant for everybody to catch on to this. Most people read this and they think about, oh, that happened with Jesus. All right, okay, that's Jesus. But Jesus was not, Jesus was not really God. Otherwise, yeah, I wish I what was he doing praying to God? Now he was not the most high, but you know he's he's a God, but he's not the most high God. Like we just saw in Psalm forty-seven, there's a lot of people that believe that Yahweh Shai has gotten, which I used to believe that too. Go to my videos early on, you'll see that I was calling Yahweh Shai Yahweh. All right, I was calling Yahweh Shai Yahweh. But when Yahweh Shai prays, all right. Basically, he's calling upon your house. All right. The rich young ruler comes to Yahweh Shai, oh, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit, to inherit eternal life? Why well, callest thou me good? There's one good, there's none good, but one, that's God. All right. So Yahweh Shai was not God. All right. And there's another prayer he prays, and what is it? I think it's John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. So he he didn't say Jesus Christ whom God has sent is the only true God. He said, Thee are the only true God. You are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom we have sent, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, or Yahweh Shai Mashiach whom the only true God has sent, okay? So when her child was caught up in the God, that means to be in God. So he's gonna be caught up to being God. That's what that's saying right there. And he's gonna be caught up to not only being God, but he's gonna be caught up to his throne, okay? So like Solomon said, will, will God indeed dwell on the earth? All right, that's, that's 1 Kings chapter eight, verse 20. Let's see, verse 27, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Question mark. Solomon said that, the wisest man that ever lived. All right, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, asked a question. His question was, to be or not to be? <laughs> no, that's not what his question was. His question was, was basically ingenious. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Because he's building Yahweh's house right there. That's what he's praying in front of. He built the house. But he asked the question, well, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Indeed dwell on the earth. And her child was caught up into God and to his throne. Who is this woman that's brought forth this child? Israel. So Israel is giving birth as a nation to God. All right. And he's looked at as a man child here in Revelation chapter 12, Isaiah 66, he's called a man child. Again, before, I, before Revelation, he's called a man child in Isaiah 66. Before her pains came, she was delivered of a man child. That means, you know, right here it says she's travailing in birth to, get, to be delivered. Now, in Isaiah 66, it said before her pain came, before she, was, before she went through any tribulation, she was delivered of a man child, all right? So that means before the great tribulation that comes up on the earth, that Yahweh I spoke about, like there, was, there would be no other tribulation like it. This man is gonna sin. Because right here it said he was caught up and that word caught up, let's look at it real quick. I think it's called, what is it? What is that word, Drake? Papazzo, or Papazzo? 
yeah, caught up. Some people say it's a rapture, but there is no rapture in the, in the there's no word for, for rapture. There's no rapture in the scriptures. But right here, she the, her child was caught up, her puzzle. Right here. Child was caught up. What does her puzzle mean? What does that mean? Derivation, deriv derivation of to seize. Let's take a look at that real quick. To seize. That means to grab, you know, sort of like to grab or whatever, to seize. All right, let's see, hold on just a moment. Let me highlight that, to seize in various applications, to catch, to catch away, to pluck, pull, take by force. So a child basically ascends. We see it in Psalm 40, 47, he ascended up. But in, when we look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, all right, we see that when Yah, when Yah bought with those two angels, bought uh, Lot and his children, his family out of Sodom, for he rained judgment on them with fire. We see that Yahweh, that was that Yahweh is the one that really, really bought them out. All right, Yahweh bought them out because it says it at the end of the story that Yahweh bought them when they when they came out of the city. They was talking, Lot was talking to Yahweh, that that angel or angels turned into Yahweh. All right, and it says Yahweh rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. The Yahweh that was on the earth that brought Sodom, brought Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, rained fire from heaven from Yahweh that was in heaven. So let me let me say this again. It says Yahweh that that was that led Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, rained fire and brimstone on Sodom from Yahweh in heaven. Catch that. We know that Yahweh was only one, but this Yahweh on earth rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. All right? He's not two. Here are Israel, Yahweh, Allah, Yahweh is one, Yahweh. He's one. He's not two, three, four. And then some people say he's three persons. I heard a pastor told me, and we was arguing about it, and along with some of, some of the members of the church, the same church click said Yahweh is three persons, three distinct individual persons. And I'm thinking to myself, that just don't make any sense. How is he three distinct individual persons? Well, we see the scripture saying, Yah Yahweh Allah is one Yahweh. And it says, thou shalt love him. It didn't say thou shalt love them for your heart, mind, and soul, by thou shalt love him. That means Yahweh is one. Even the, the, the personal pronoun that he uses for him is a singular personal pronoun. All right? So y'all shall love him. So Yahweh that bought Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. That's not two. That's one. That means he was only ever eating Sodom, Lot out of Sodom and raining fire and brimstone down upon Sodom and Gomorrah at the same time while he was on the earth. That's why I say he's a trip. <laughs> He's going to be something else. And really, our joy is going to be in him. What we saw in Psalm 47, it says, sing praises unto him with joy. You know, basically, as Psalm says, the people are going through crazy fits of joy. You know, the, the basically, the Feast of Trumpets is going to have people happy. You, can, you know, the, the scripture says that in that day shall the earth be filled with the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Because people are going to be joying and who they, they see in this Yahweh in Jerusalem. They're going to be joying in, in the fact that, that who he is and what he's done and what he's doing. It's going to be a trip. It's going to be something else. All right? They're going to be happy, joyful. Because it's, it's more like the Queen of Sheba said, the half had not been told. Or really, the half had not been told about this kingdom that's coming. Okay? It's to see the harpazo that he was caught up to catch away, pull up, pull up, pull, take by force. That means that Yahweh in heaven, just like we saw that Yahweh on earth, who was the same person as Yahweh in heaven, basically Yahweh that was in heaven right here, took this man child up by force. In other words, he's, he's taking his own self up by force. All right? He pulled his own self up to heaven and he set him on his own throne because that is, he, he's the same person, all right? Same person. So Yahweh Shai 
is sitting right there on the right hand and watching this, that Yahweh that was in the earth has come up to the heavens, he's ascended. And it's sitting on the throne that he's sitting right next to. All right. <laughs> it's really so not like I said, it's a trip. Once you learn the truth of all of this, you, you for one thing, you crack up laughing like I'm doing right now. Because this dragon wanted to devour this child. Why did the dragon want to devour the child? The dragon is who? The devil and Satan, right? What did what was he trying to do? He was trying to literally keep God out of his throne from being God. He's trying to keep God from being God. And she brought up the man child to rule all nations with a rod of iron and that child was caught up into God into his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand three hundred, three hundred, two hundred and three square days. Now watch this. Satan is thrown down the earth. We're gonna see why Satan is thrown out of heaven. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So what has to happen in order for Satan to be kicked out? Let's continue to read. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who was the deceiver of the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation. Now, now check this out. Many people saying this is Yahweh Shai, but this man child, which is really Yahweh, becoming, well, like, like I said, it's, it's Yahweh becoming. So Yahweh basically took all, just like Yahweh Shai did, he took his glory off of him and come down, emptied of his glory and come down as a, as a poor little man. Well, Yahweh's doing the same thing. Yahweh Shai's life is prophesying about the father. He does whatever the father does. He did it before the father, you know, but let me, let me go on, let me continue this. Most people can't catch that, all right? A lot of people can't catch it, but a lot of people can. If you can, if you catch on to this, blessed are you, all right? And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil, and Satan was deceived with the whole world. He cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, the kingdom, kingdom of our God. See that? What, 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 what came when this man, was, this man child was caught up? To God and his throne, the kingdom. Get happy, folks, all right? Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And we hit it straight for the Feast of Trumpets. That's what Feast of Trumpets is all about. Is Yahweh going to do it this year? Is he going to send into heaven and bring the kingdom of God? All right? Strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. So the kingdom of our God, and guess what? For those of you that basically have to see Yahweh Shai in this, and the power of his grace. So basically, it's not the power of the Christ. Let me highlight the whole thing if I can. Let me see. Zoop. Zoop. Okay, hold on just a moment. So the power of Yahweh Shai is not going to come until this man child sends up. So Yahweh Shai is sitting on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. But his power to do what he's going to do in the future is not going to come until this man child is caught up. So he's waiting himself. He's sitting there rooting and waiting for this man child to become Yahweh. Uh, please catch on to this. <laughs> if you don't, if you, it's hard for you to catch it, study, please. All right. Yahweh Shai is sitting on the right hand of the throne in heaven. He's not down here. He's sitting on the right hand of the throne in heaven, waiting for this man child to be caught up into God to his throne. The dragon is trying to devour the child before he's born, before he comes into, his, into, his, into his, his, his purpose, which is he becomes God. He becomes Yahweh. When this man becomes Yahweh, he goes into heaven, and the angels are now empowered to fight against the dragon and whip his tail. As I said, they're going to whip his tail. All right, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. I mean, their tails got whipped up in heaven. It was cast, and it was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, that was deceived of the whole world. He cast him out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And the voice from heaven said, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. 
So the, the power of Yahawashai is second place in the situation. Yahawashai already, his life prophesied about this king that brings the kingdom of God, all right? For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. So, so this, while this man is on the earth, Yahweh is still on the throne up in heaven. Or is he? I'm going to show you something in a second or two, but hold on. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives even unto the death. Therefore rejoice heavens, you heavens, and you that dwell in them are woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devils come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth but that his time is short. So what the devil wants to do, he don't want that man child being caught up. Why? Because when that man child is caught up, he's kicked out of heaven. When he kicked out of heaven, he, he has to come down here and basically fight for his existence because he's going to the lake of fire next. So while, the, while this man child has not been caught up to God yet, all right, why that hasn't happened yet, he's trying to keep it like that. So what is the dragon trying to do? He's standing before the woman trying to devour the child as soon as he was born. Let's go back where that was saying that, where it said that at. Revelation 12. Verse four. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse four. Part B. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Let me highlight it for you. The part B is like the B side when we used to listen to 45s, you know, record players. You listen to a, 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 a what is it, a 45 record? They always have a B side to it, you know. But anyway, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. So, why is this dragon trying to devour this child? Because he knows that if this child is caught up and fulfills his purpose on earth, he's going to be kicked out of heaven. So his whole purpose is to make sure that this child that's coming into existence as God doesn't happen or he slows the process down, all right? And most people, like I said, most people are deceived in their doctrine about this, all right? And it said, and, uh, it said that the dragon deceived the whole world. Let me highlight that real quick. That means including Christianity. That means including the church pastors, okay? The ones that's teaching. They went on Yahweh shot. Like I said, Yahweh got upset with me when I got to teaching about some of the things that was not about him. Got upset, it was wrong with me. I'm gonna be honest with you. All right, it was wrong with me about getting off of teaching what he anointed me to teach. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Let me see, let me highlight it from that point right there, deceiveth the whole world. That's how important this is. I'm taking my time to highlight it. This deceiveth the whole world. That includes the Christian world, which deceiveth the whole world. And, cast, and he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, how is he deceiving the world in this situation? He's deceiving the world because they, Basically, they don't know that Yahweh is going to, like Solomon said, Yahweh is going to indeed dwell on the earth. All right? So Yahweh basically, the life of Yahweh prophesies about Yahweh. There's a scripture in the Revelation that says, for the, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. His life is a prophecy. Testimony is in the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in the world to the inhabitants of the earth. So when this happens, this is when the great tribulation takes place. You know, when Yahweh Shai says about the days of Lot and the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be when the Son of Man is revealed. Let me see if I can go there real quick. That's even why I don't write out these, these, these sermons and all that, just going with Yahweh wants me to teach. Because I'm going to get off of the topic and just go with the Spirit. So when the Son of Man is revealed, that word revealed is revelation. When the Son of Man, let me take my time and do this. I'm still suffering, y'all.
So we, when the Son of Man is revealed in the latter days, that's going to bring the tribulation. What Son of Man revealed? Okay, let me get this last word on here, revealed. That word reveal is short for revelation. Luke 17, 30, let's go there real quick. I want to go a few scriptures before that so you can see the context. Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So the Son of Man, is that talking about Yahweh Shai? All right? Sometime when Yahweh Shai is speaking, see, if you don't know this, you're thinking that every time Yahweh Shai says Son of Man, you think it's talking about himself. All right? So as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were married, given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. It. But the same day that Lot was, went out of Sodom and rained fire and brimstone from heaven, like what I just told you about, Yahweh that was on the earth, rained fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, Luke 17 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And that day he which was to be up on the housetop. So right here, this is a major scripture. The son of man is revealed. Did it say in that day is really be when the son of man comes down from heaven and lands on the Mount of Olives? It's, it's giving you an example of Noah entering into an ark. He's on the earth. He's entering into an ark and then the flood came and there was destruction. Lot was on the earth. He was not from heaven. He was on the earth. And when Lot left Sodom, fire and brimstone came down and destroyed them all, right? So the example of this son of man is, is the same thing as Noah and Lot. Noah and Lot both were on the earth. The example is this son of man is going to be on the earth. I hope you catch it. Even that shall it be when the son of man is revealed. All right, that means he's on the earth and he's revealed. How is he revealed? Now, 2nd Ezra chapter 13 speaks about a man coming up out of the sea, right? A man coming up out of the sea and flying over the, all over the place. Remember in, in Daniel chapter 7, when it speaks about the four beasts that came out of the sea, the great sea, the sea is people. The sea is represented by people. Coming up out of a lot of people, the great people, the great mass of people. So when you see in 2nd Edges chapter 13, this man coming up out of the sea. When I read that for the first time with the idea that yeah, we know that the angel said the same Jesus that you see going into heaven in Acts chapter 1. So likewise coming as like, likewise as he came. So as he left, he's going to come just like he left. That means he's going to ascend up on the Mount of Olives. But we see the man in 2nd Ezra chapter 13, in some, some books, some Bibles, it's 4th Ezra chapter 13. We see this man coming up out of the sea, sea of people. He's coming up out of the earth. All right? He's coming out of the earth. Is that Yahweh Shai? No, it ain't. Who is it? The Ancient of Days. That's who it is. That's the Father. And the dragon, Satan, who deceived the whole world, don't want you to understand that in your doctrine. Even that shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. Revealed. Anybody that reads this should, should question. Say, what is, should it say, even that shall it be when the Son of Man comes? No, it's talking about being revealed. That means he's in the earth and he's revealed. Because Noah and Lot both are in the earth. They're not coming from heaven. And then destruction takes place. So anybody that basically is think is a thinker should look at this and say, wait a minute, in the day when the Son of Man is Yahweh going to be on the earth? And they're going to get revealed? 
But what happens in second Ezra is that the man is coming out of the sea. That means the sea of people. And what happens is, I, let's, let me take you somewhere else real quick. First Corinthians chapter 15. So we see that when the Son of Man is revealed, which is really Yahweh, is in ascending up to God into his throne. All right. What happens first, what takes place, has to take place first, is that he is basically ordained to die. Satan is standing before him to kill him. To devour him, and he's already born, you know, those are, those are examples, those are, uh, how can I put it? When it says that she brought forth a man's child, she was pained to be delivered. You there's no woman, there's no literal woman called Israel in here. That basically a mass of people that's called Israel. And she's likened unto a virgin, to a woman that has 12 stars on her head, crowned with 12 stars. She's, she's clothed with the sun, the moon, and her feet. So you have to really put this in perspective. How is this woman that literally is not a real physical woman going to bring forth this man's child? You, you something to think about. Well, let me let me see if I can I can make it simple. Sounds simple. That Israel, this man child will be amongst his people. Israel, among the nations, they will be in captivity. And because he's in the earth. Israel will start going through, when it looked like they was gonna start going through peace, they're gonna start going through tribulation. And the more he becomes who he is, the more tribulation they're gonna, they're gonna go through. So when you, we saw after Martin Luther King, everything cooled down and hushed down. Martin Luther King was killed, Malcolm X was killed in the, in the mid 60s, Martin Luther King was killed in 68. Everything hushed down. We, we, all of a sudden people start dancing, disco. All right, disco, there was a great time of peace for Israel, not for the, not for the nations. They was upset and angry. They wanted to get this man out of office that was giving these people some peace. All right, and get somebody in there like Reagan. All right, that's gonna oppress these people. Don't put these people down. But what we see is, is that um, the more these people, the more this man that was among the nations, that, that was among his people, Israel, among the nations, in captivity, the more he started to grow up and become more of who he is and what he was, who he is to come and what he's gonna be, the more these nations got angry. Why did he enrage? Why did the people imagine the vain thing? All right? They basically are sensing, just like we, you, know, you, can, you can sense your oppressors. They're sensing Yahweh, they're sensing these people have hope. The more hope these people have, the, the more they hate it. The more it, it makes them afraid. They have to do something to you. They have to find this person and kill him. They have to, they have to, they have to make sure that this deliverer in Egypt is thrown to the crocodiles. They have to make sure that this one that's born king of the Jews is killed quickly. They have to make sure this man child is devoured as soon as he's born. The, the part about this child, man child being born is that all of a sudden, bling there's like a popcorn, you know, popcorn is on heat, we've got some oil on it. All of a sudden it pops up, pop. When it pops, it's no longer in that same, it's no, it's no longer in that same uh, state that it was in. You, you know, the popcorn is like a little seed, a dried up hard seed. When you put it in a, in a popcorn popper with some oil or whatever, and it's got some heat on it, and then you can see the, the oil sizzling, it was not gonna take long for that thing to go pop. What you got is the popcorn. That means what was on the inside is now on the outside. That's what it's gonna kind of, kind of, kind of be like. Once, once this man is born, there's nothing, there's nothing the dragon gonna be able to do with it. Okay, so that's the reason why the, the dragon stood before the woman in Revelation 12 to devour the child as soon as it was born. What happened? Pop! <laughs> All right? What do you think that dragon can do with Yahweh himself? Nothing. We see in the book of Job, 
that Yahweh plays with Leviathan like he's a little, like he's a little child, like he's a pet, like he's a little pet. So I can see Yahweh becoming from his manly position, from being a man, a son of man, all of a sudden Poppy becomes Yahweh. All right. Oh, get out of here, Dino! You know, like like the, the the monster, the move, the the sitcom that used to be in the sixties and seventies called the Monsters, and they had a pet that was a dragon called Dino. Get out of here, Dino! Who you think who you think you're dealing with? Get out of here! And Dino says, "Oh boy, I was just playing with you." <laughs> you know, in the book of Job it says he plays with Leviathan. Yahweh plays with him like a little pet, like a toy. So what happens when that man child becomes Yahweh? You talking about dragon gonna devour him? What we just read? It says the heavens and the earth cannot cannot contain Yahweh. How much more this house yeah, Solomon built? So when this man becomes Yahweh, and what I mean by becoming, we see in the book of Revelation chapter one, he says he was, is, and is to come. The Almighty was is and is to come, the Almighty. I, I think I'll take you there in a second or two, but how is this gonna happen? Well, Yahweh Shai was the down payment on him becoming Yahweh. Yahweh Shai came down here to become the lamb. And, you, and like I said, some people might wanna make fun of this, but when, when Abraham, was uh, tested by Yah to take his son and sacrifice him on the altar of the mountain that Yahweh would choose for him in Mount Moriah. All right. Yahweh didn't mean for him to kill his son. He was showing an example of what Yah was going to do. He was preaching the gospel to Abraham. Abraham caught on before the whole thing was over with. Because his son asked him, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where's the lamb? Where's the, where's the, where's the burnt offering? And Abraham told his son Isaac, My son, my child, Yahweh will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So this lamb was really for Yahweh. Yahweh Shai was really for Yahweh. All right, he was a lamb for Yahweh. That's why he's called the lamb of God. That means God would indeed, like Solomon said, will indeed dwell on earth. But this God that dwells on earth in the latter days is not going to be like, like the Pope, somebody trying to be perfect and all of that. No. He does good, like I said earlier, he does good and he does evil. That's why he's terrible, like we just saw in Psalm 47, he's terrible. He does good and does evil at his own will. But you gotta believe it that he loves Israel, he loves covenant, he keeps covenant. Israel is his bride, his wife forever. But anyway, how's, how's this gonna happen? How's it gonna become your house? All right? So let's see, First Corinthians chapter, let's see. For as in, let's see, First Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, for Adam sin and all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, watch this. Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that Christ that is coming. All right. Every man, every man in his own order. Christ the first fruit, afterwards they that are Christ that is coming. Okay. But watch this. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Wait a minute. You're saying that Yahweh Shai has got a kingdom right now. All right, Yahweh Shai is sitting on the right hand of God up in heaven, but he's got a kingdom. That's what, that's what this is saying. A lot of people think, and they, that's how they reason the scripture, that in the millennium, Yahweh Shai is gonna reign. And after he reigns for a thousand years, he's gonna deliver up the kingdom of God, and that's it. No, that's not how that happened. In other words, who's reigning over the earth right now? Yahweh Shai wasn't sat on the right hand of God, all right? So who's reigning over the earth? You mean he's been he's been let the devil reign over the earth 2,000 years? No, it's Yahweh Shai is reigning over the earth. 
when he rose from the dead in Matthew 28, verse 19, 18, 19, and 20, he says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He told his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to, to observe all I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. So Yahweh is reigning over the earth with his church. So basically, the reason why the world is being ran like it is so that Yahweh can, can, can basically raise his church. So the church is really ran by Yahweh excuse me, the world is being, really being ran by Yahweh building up his church. Then come up the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God. So he's going to basically finish his work on the church. When he finishes his work on the church, he's going to deliver up the kingdom, this kingdom, to God, to, to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and authority. So how you know, yeah, he's reigning right now. Watch this. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. So he's, he's reigning with the church. He's putting the enemies of the church under his feet. Watch this. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Let me highlight that. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So he's putting the enemies up under the church's feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, the thing about this, remember Yahweh said that he was in the Father and the Father was in him? What do you think that means? He said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That means that he was in the Father. And if, how would you be in Christ if you're the Father? you would have to be in the body of Christ. That means you have to be a believer. So the father is in Christ. That means he's in the body of Christ. So he's like a saint. He's gonna come down here and be a saint and be in the body of Christ. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. How is this gonna happen? Who is that gonna happen with? For he, must, for he had put all things under his feet when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he has accepted, which did put all things under him. So basically the father is not gonna die. What's gonna happen is the father, is the, that last enemy, all right? And that last enemy is the same word for ladder. So it's talking about the latter day enemy. So what is, what's really reigning over the world as an enemy of the church? Greek 2078, let's take a look at that real quick. Asketos. All right. Asketos. It means uh, furthest, final, or place of time. Ends of, ends of, because he's on the low, I'm with you until the ends of the earth. Ends of, last, latter end. Okay, I'm going to go there real quick. So it says latter end. And this word is also used a little later on when it's talking about the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. That word last is basically the same thing, latter end. The latter end. So the latter end enemy over Yah's, against Yah's church and his people is death. So what happens? Death is destroyed. How is the death destroyed? Because the kingdom is going to be given, this word we just saw. And come at the end when he shall deliver the kingdom back unto God, even the Father. And he put down all authority and rule and power. So he must reign to you, put all enemies on his feet. Last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That last word, eschatos, means ladder. Some of where we're at now, the ladder end. All right. So he had put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. That means that the Father is gonna be the one that escapes death. He's the one that's gonna overcome death, all right? That word accepted right there is key to this, that he is accepted, which he did put all things under him. So that means that the father, just like when, I, when, when I'm talking about this, most Hebrew Israelites and most people in the world, even Christians, are waiting on Jesus. That means the father, wait a minute, you're not, you wait, I see the father sitting over there, right over there saying, man, they still don't accept me. They accept my son, anybody else except me. But right here it says it's manifest that he has accepted which did put all things under Yahweh. 
So there's going to come a time when Yahweh is going to be accepted. In the wilderness, they rebelled against him. Everywhere that Israel dwelt, all the way up until Yahweh shine, they rejected the Father. But right here it says it's manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Because he says, sit down my right hand in Psalm 110, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The last enemy that's going to be made Yahweh Shai's footstool is death. And he's coming down himself to make sure that happens. Let's go down a little further. And all things shall be subdued unto him. That means Yahweh Shai is going to subdue all things, including death. How is he going to subdue death? Because Yahweh Shai already died and rose again. Who's he going to, who's he going to, going, going, going to defeat death with? The Father. There's a scripture in, what is it? John chapter, is it 10? When Lazarus died, Yahweh Shai stayed in the place where he was at four days because he wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead. When he showed up on the scene, his sisters and them were mourning. They said, you, if you had been here, you could have, you know, our brother would not have died. Yahweh Shai already knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise him from the dead. He said, this death is not, not just for him to be dead. It's so that the son of God can be glorified. It happened so he could raise him from the dead and everybody could see it. All right. And, um, but, uh, but he rose up Lazarus from the dead. All right. Now I lost my train of thought, but he's going to subdue death. And he's going to subdue it with the father. That means the father is going to be in a very great fight with the dragon. So we see that in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon stood before the woman to devour the child as soon as it was born. Remember, this is going to be a man child. That means he's going to already be on earth. He's not going to be in his stomach. But spiritually, he's going to be in the womb of Israel. He's going to be in the center part of Israel, the, the center of Israel. The womb of Israel is the people. All right. And what happens is when he comes out of there, he's going to be Yahweh. When he comes out of the womb, when he's given birth to, he's going to be Yahweh. It's hard to explain it. All right. The more I get excited, my hand gets to shaking and everything. But uh, the house is going to subdue all things. The last enemy to be de destroyed is death. All right. Death is going to be the last enemy. And when he's talking to Mary and Martha, that's where I was just at. When he's talking to Mary and Martha about the brother dying, and he, said, he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he told him. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he's talking about Lazarus. And for all the saints that died, believing in Yahweh Shai. Though they were dead, though they are dead, they should live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in him, he's talking about the Father right here. Whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never die. All right? So he's talking about two things. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. One group of people is going to get resurrected. One group of people is going to be living and going to never die. The people that's going to be living and never die is going to be basically with the Father. The father's gonna be living and never die. How can you say this? When did this happen? This already happened. Yeah, that's how Yah planned it. All right, that's why uh, when he says the last enemy that should be destroyed and put up under his feet is death. In verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So whatever Yahweh is gonna do, this man is gonna do, he's not gonna die. All right, and that's where we see him coming up out of the sea of people in Second Ezra chapter 13. And some people's book is fourth Ezra chapter 13. And he's flying all around the place. And the nations are fighting one another. When they see him and they hear his voice, they all stop fighting each other. They come and fight him. Second Ezra chapter 13. All right. And that's where we see all of this that happens in Psalm 47, where he is seeing. We see this in the book of Daniel where there's a stone cut out without hands that smites the image in Daniel chapter two upon the feet and destroys it. This stone is cut out without hands. You ever notice that? Without hands, where do we get that word without hands? We get it from the scripture where it talks about we're gonna be given a body made without hands. Let's go there real quick. And that's in... Uh, 
second Corinthians. Paul did, I'm gonna tell you right here, Paul was talking about the father all the time. What's gonna happen? Because Paul knew what was gonna happen with the father and he basically said, I, he presses toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. What's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? It's the calling of the father. The father's gonna get the calling, all right? But he said, Any, anybody that's perfect would follow that same logic, would follow that same reasoning. They're gonna press toward the mark like as if they, if they, they could get that high calling. It doesn't mean that you're going to put a stumbling block in the way of the father so they can get the high calling. That's Satan. You're basically a child of Satan if you do that. But Paul ran to win. Not against the father, not just to beat the father, but to, as if, if he was that one, he ran to get that crown. That crown. But we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, we know that the earthly house of this tabernacle, that means your body will dissolve. We have a building of God and house, not made, let me highlight this, not made with hands, eternal in that. So basically it says that in Daniel, and I go there, I'm gonna go there in a second or two. Let me highlight this real quick. So you, so we can see this right before we go to Daniel. Because the, the image that had the, the head of gold, chest of silver, took the, the loins of brass and the legs of iron and all of that has some, that struck with a with a stone cut out without hands has something to do with this. And the house not made with hands, that means a body, eternal in the heavens, right? And for in this we groan the earnestly desire to be clothed with our, with our house, which is from heaven. But let's go to Daniel chapter two. I'm gonna go through that real fast because that's a whole discourse, long discourse about the image that, Dan, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of, that had the head of gold, chest of silver. All right, that's why you listen to me. Most of y'all, I, I assume, have been in the church or Christianity or read the Bible quite a bit to understand some of these things I'm talking about. If not, then study this Nebuchadnezzar's dream, because he had a dream where basically there was prophecy about the world empires, just like Daniel chapter seven, what well, those animals, those beasts that came out, out of the sea represented the kingdoms of the earth all the way to the time of the end where we are today. So this image, this image that he saw, all right, represents the same kingdoms, all right? The same kingdoms that Daniel, that Daniel dreamed of in Daniel chapter seven, coming out of the sea, but the same kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of in Daniel chapter two. So what happens to this image? All right, let's go there real quick. And the feet, it was, it was it's partly iron, partly clay. All right, so we know that iron represents Rome. All right. Daniel chapter two, verse 31, the old king saw us and behold, a great image, a great image. His brightness was excellent, excellent, stood before thee, and the form there was terrible. He saw that, remember in Psalm 47, Yahweh is terrible, that reigns over the earth. But this form there was ter terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, the breasts and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and feet part of iron, part of, care, part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Let me highlight this. Stone was cut out with hand, without hands, with smote the image on the feet, they were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, silver, gold broken to pieces. We got them became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away and no, no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. But let, me, let me highlight this real quick. The stone that was cut out with our hands. What we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that this earthly house, our bodies will dissolve. We have a building of God and the heavens eternal, not made with hands. All right, so let's see. So when it says with our hands, it has something to do with death being conquered. So the resurrection is death being conquered. So if, you're being, if, you, if your earthly house of this tabernacle will dissolve, that means you die. You have a building of God, made, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That means a new body. All right, 
So what this is talking about, what defeats this image is death being conquered. Death being defeated. The last enemy that should be put up on the Yahweh's feet in the heavens is death. All right, the last enemy to be defeated and put up on his feet is death and destroyed is death. So thou saw it till the stone was cut out with our hands, was smote the image upon his feet, which were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. See that? So this, the stone that was cut out with our hands has to be this one that's coming. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the stone on the corner. So it's not only talking about Yahweh Remember, Yahweh is a prophecy about the father. And they rejected him, but the stone which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. So Yahweh became the headstone of the church, the body of Christ, reigning in the earth. And what did he say about the church? He said, Thou, thou Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, that means the gates of the grave, shall not prevail against it. That means that whatever this gate is, it has something to do with death should not prevail against his church. That means the last enemy that should be defeated in Yahweh is death. So thou saw till the stone was cut out without hands with smoke the image upon the feet, which were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. It gives the interpretation, but we're not gonna go there. But it's to show that this, this stone cut out without hands has something to do with an eternal body, all right? So what eternal body does this have something to do with? Let's go there real quick. So it has something to do with an eternal body, death being defeated. I want to go with the spirit, what the spirit is telling me. Let's see here. Remember in 2nd Ezra chapter 13, that this man that's on the earth that's flying around like Superman that comes out of the sea, the sea of people. He's not flying, he's not coming from heaven, but he's coming out of the earth, out of the sea, the sea of people. That's what makes that the whole chapter kind of confusing for a lot of people to read it because we're waiting on Yahweh Shai to come down from heaven like the angel said in Acts chapter one. But this is another thing going on. This man's coming out of the sea. That means out of the sea of people. And what happens is that the man that's being chased down by the nations that were fighting one another, then when they see him and hear his voice, they come to fight him, okay? It says that the man formed a mountain in the air, grazed the mountain and flew up upon it. We know that mountain was Mount Zion that he grazed up in the air and flew up upon it, all right? And right here in Isaiah chapter 25, verse six says, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts Yahweh of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on leaves, a feast of full, a feast of fat things full of marrow, of wine on leaves well refined. And he shall destroy in this mountain the face of the covering castle of all people, and the veil that is spread of all nations. So on this mountain that he formed in the air in 2 Ezra chapter 13, he's gonna destroy the face of the covering castle of all people. What is that? What is that covering cast? What is it? Verse eight, he will swallow up death and victory. Who is this gonna swallow up death and victory? Yahweh of hosts, the most high. The one we, the one we just read about reigning over the earth in Psalm chapter 47. Why is he looked at as being terrible? Because he swallowed up death and victory. So I'm gonna highlight this, Yahweh of hosts is the one that does it, all right? Yahweh of hosts is going to swallow up death and victory. Okay, let's go back to what we just said. He will swallow up death and victory in Yahweh or Adonai Yahweh. Whenever you see this word Yahweh, which is God, all caps God, all right, and I'm going to highlight it real quick. Whenever you see this word Yahweh, it's basically taken off of Exodus chapter 3 when he says, My name is, you know, you call me higher, I'm higher, which means I will become. So who's going to become? 
that man child is going to become. What is he going to become? He's going to become Yahweh. He was, is, and is to come. All right. So 3069, that's Yahweh. Yahweh. There's no V in really uh, Paleo Hebrew. So what it is is Yahweh. That V is a, is a W sound, a Y. That E right here is a Yah. Just like in Paleo Hebrew, Yahweh. This is Yahweh. It's taken off in, in, in Paleo Hebrew, it's taken off the word Ahaya. It comes from there. Okay. Ahaya means to become. Right here it says Adonai Yahweh. All right. And if you highlight it, up there it says Yahweh Hope, but this right here, Adonai Yahweh. So Yahweh is going to become. That means it's talking about this man and child that we just read about in Revelation chapter 12. He will swallow up death and victory. We read it again, Isaiah 58, 25, 8. He will swallow up death and victory. And Adonai Yahweh will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people will take off from off all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken it. So let me highlight that. Because his people got a rebuke on them of, of all nations. Everybody, everywhere you go, everybody hates these people. All right, let me highlight it real quick. So I'm going to take you to another place to prove that this one is the one that sits on the throne. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away, take up, take away from up all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. But earlier it said he will wipe away tears from up all faces, right? He will swallow up death and victory, and Adonai Yahweh will take will wipe away tears from up all faces. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter seven. But who's the one that's gonna wipe away all tears from up all faces? Adonai Yahweh, the one that sits on the throne, right? So this one that wiped the that wipes away all tears from my fall faces has to be the one that overcomes death for us. So it's not just Yahweh overcoming death and being resurrected. This death that's got to be overcome it has to be done for the whole body of Christ. And the one that does this is the one that sits on the throne. Because basically we're in him in the latter days. Remember, you remember Yahweh said, I'm in the Father and the Father in me. Okay. So something's got to happen for somebody that's in the body of Christ that has to do with overcoming death. For it to be permanent for all the members, all the all the members of the body. All right. So remember, he, he's gonna wipe away off of all, all, all tears from off all faces, right? This Adonai Yahweh, the one that sits on the throne. Let's go down here right quick. Revelation chapter seven, verse 17, for your hot, for the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, shall lead them into living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from off all eyes. See that? Let me highlight it for you. The lamb is gonna be in the midst of the throne. Gonna be around the throne. So this God right here that sits on the throne is the one that overcomes death. He's the one that wipes away all tears from off all faces. There it is. And God shall wipe away all tears from off all eyes, up from their eyes. It doesn't say the lamb did, it said God. Now remember the lamb, a lot of people think he's really God. You know, Yahweh, the most high. He's not the most high. He, otherwise, he would not be the Lamb of God. If he was God, he'd be called God the Lamb. God, G-O-D, the Lamb. But right here it says he's called the Lamb of God. But he's not God. He's not the Most High. He is a God, but he's not the Most High God. And God shall wipe away all tears from our fault from their eyes. All right. So this is a, this God that we're waiting on. We're not waiting on the Lamb. The Lamb is waiting on Him to basically put death under His feet. 
All right? The lamb is waiting on Yahweh to put death under his feet for the whole body of Christ. This God is going to be in the earth. This Yahweh is going to be in the earth becoming. So let's go back to here, 1 Corinthians 15. And so it is written, first comes in 15, 30, 45, and so it is written, first man Adam was made a living soul. Let me highlight this for you. So Adam, the first man that was created, was made a living soul. Let me highlight that real fast for you. Now Satan would, now Satan would have you to believe that this last Adam is Jesus. It's Yahweh Shai. Remember, he deceives the whole world. That means he's not only in the world, he's in the church. Anytime you go into one church, it says they're saying one thing, you go into another church, they're saying a whole other ball game. Something's wrong, all right? So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. So who is this last Adam? This last Adam is not Yahweh Shai. Latter-day Adam is what it really is. So when you look at this Greek 2078, It's latter day, latter end Adam. Yahweh Shai was not at the latter end. He's at basically 4,000 years in the earth's existence, man up on the earth. But this one would be on the earth 6,000 years into the existence of the earth. The latter end. Yahweh Shai said it too. He said, No, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. That's where this word right here comes in ends. Let me highlight that ends of the earth. Why is he with the church all the way to the end? Because the father is going to be at the end. Okay, how do you know? Listen to what Job said. I know that my redeemer liveth. In the latter day, he will stand up on the earth. That means the latter end, he will stand up on the earth. All right. So the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a cooking. What does that mean to be a cooking spirit? That's what I say. He's a trip. <laughs> this is something like you can't even make a comic book off of something like this. Somebody that can be in every place at the same time. And when, while he's not becoming, not why he hasn't become yet, he's a, he's he's in. How can I put it? He's Yahweh in heaven. But when he becomes, he's going to be basically a human being everywhere at the same time. Now, just think of that. A human being that's a spirit. A human being that, that is a spirit. Remember when Yahweh showed up and showed himself to his disciples? Let me see if I can find that real quick. When Yahweh showed up to his disciples and came into the room when they had it voted, locked shut for fear of the Jews. Let me see, where is that at? Is that in the book of John? He like came in there because he entered into the fourth dimension and came back into the third dimension. They were afraid because they thought they saw a spirit. He basically tried to reassure their hearts. He said, a spirit does not eat and drink as you saw me eat and drink. Let me see if I can find it real quick. John 20, verse 20. Resurrection. So he ate something for them so they can not so they can not be afraid, not afraid of. But this Yahweh will be a human spirit. Let's see. Probably, and let's go to Luke real quick. Bear with me for a moment. So, this Yahweh will be a human spirit. That means, just like he is right now, he's, you know, like Solomon said, the heaven and the heaven of the heavens cannot contain thee. That means he's everywhere. 
is even in time periods. That means time does not have anything on it. Let's see here. He will be a human spirit. That means he will become. That means what he was in the earth, he will be that plus more. You, will, you see him as the ancient of days in Daniel chapter seven, that basically knocks down all the thrones. That's the reason why you see the people trying to get with him in second Ezra chapter 13. There's nothing they can do with him. He breathes upon him and he makes him all dust and ashes. All right. Resurrection. Let me see. Let me go down here to Bear with me. Here it is. And as they, Luke 24, 36, and as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. And suppose that they had seen a spirit. See that? Let me highlight this for you so you can see it. So what was Jesus raised? What was your house I raised as? He's raised as a body, physical body. Not a spirit. The one that's going to be, become a quickening spirit is, is Yahweh. Remember, he told the woman at the well, God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So they supposed that they had seen a spirit. They were affrighted, terrified. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that is I myself, handle me. And see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me here. Yeah. Let me highlight that real quick. Hope you're listening real good. Because what your what your Habashai is, he's a he's a spirit that he's excuse me, not a spirit, he's a he's a resurrected body. He's a person resurrected. Supernatural, yeah, but He's a person that's resurrected. See, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me here. That means Yahweh Shai has flesh and bones. See that? And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not but joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you hear any have you hear any meat? Have you hear any meat? Is there any meat in here? Is what he said. And they gave him a piece of broad fish and a, and a, and of a honeycomb. He took them and did eat before them. And he said to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scripture. See, so the fact that Yahweh Shai rises from the dead is a prophecy of this man that's in the latter day, that's gonna be Yahweh, basically becoming a quickening spirit. Except this man is gonna become a quickening spirit, he's not gonna to have to die, become a quickening spirit. I, I use the, the analogy of a popcorn, a kernel of a popcorn seasoned in a, in, a, in a pot with some oil boiling it, and all of a sudden it goes pop, all right? The, the, the oil boiling it, the heat and all of that is trouble for him. But what the trouble does, it causes him to pop, become popcorn, you know, <laughs> it's a little corny, but I'm trying to explain the best of the way that I can, how this man is gonna become a quickening spirit. And this man that becomes a quickening spirit, he's not just flesh, he's gonna be a flesh, how can I put it? He's gonna be flesh and he's gonna be flesh and everything, but he's not gonna be flesh, he's gonna be a spirit that is flesh. Okay, let me, let me, let me take you to some place else real quick. First Timothy. This is vastly becoming one of my favorite scriptures. So remember, he's first Adam was made of living soul. The last latter day Adam, I know that my redeemer liveth, and the latter day he will stand upon the earth. That last that latter day Adam that Job was talking about, he called him Yahweh. Call him as redeemer. He's not talking about Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai played a part in the redemption 
but this one that comes in the latter day to put death under Yahweh's feet is the Redeemer. Because he's basically, it's his life that's going to be used to put that death under Yahweh's feet. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. What? What? Remember, he's made a quickening spirit. Who's the one that quickeneth all things? God. Did it say the lamb quickeneth all things? No. Nope. Let me highlight this real quick. I like the whole thing. I give thee charge in the sight of God, in the sight of God, the creator, who quickeneth all things. This one that basically comes in the latter days that's going to be made a quickening spirit is going to be in the earth. All right. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and within before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, witness a good confession. It didn't say Christ Jesus quickeneth all things. God is the one that quickeneth all things. Can we go back there again to the first Corinthians that we can real quick? Let's go back there. That God quickeneth all things. So when the resurrection happened, guess who's gonna do it? God, the one that becomes a human being. All right, let's see if we go back to history. He becomes a human being, but then he becomes a quickening spirit. All right, let's see, 1 Corinthians 15. Like I said, we, <laughs> eye has not seen or ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that he has prepared for those that love him. If you catch on to this, you will be rejoicing. You smile about this, because this is what's coming for Israel. Like Isaiah 25 says, he's going to take away the rebuke of his people of all the earth. Are we going to do it? No, he's going to, he's the one that's going to take the rebuke of his people off all the earth. Because he's going to judge the nations. He's going to be a bad boy. Oh my goodness. All right. You see all nations coming to him bound down. All right. The sword is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a what? Quickening spirit. The same word right there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I give thee charge on the side of God of quickening of all things. And before Christ Jesus, which Christ Jesus is basically what does a good confession for a point is pilot. Christ Jesus is not quickening us. The one that does the quickening is a quickening spirit. What do you mean quickening spirit? The same spirit that Yahweh was talking to the woman at the well, said God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But he becomes a human being and becomes a quickening spirit. He comes into human humanity because it uses him in a, in, in, in a, as an example of Adam. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, like we just saw right here, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The, the first man, as it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. And right here, it says, was made. Notice, notice it's in italics that was made. I didn't even highlight it. It's, it's just to show you that it's in italics. That means it wasn't in the original. That was made was not in the original writings. So the way it's written, the way it should be written, is the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam a quickening spirit. That was made, you, remember it was cut out with our hands. It's not without, he wasn't made. He's the one that made everything. All right. So Adam, you know, Yahweh told the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But such worshipers, Yah, God seeks to worship him. So this person right here, he's not going to be flesh and bone, but he's going to be a spirit that has flesh and bones. If I can say that correctly. He's going to be a spirit that has flesh and bones. A spirit is what he really is, a quickening spirit. We read 2227 with the word quicken. Let's take a look at that real quick. Zuo Pio. Zuo Poio. Zuo Poio. All right. To revitalize. Literally, figuratively, to make alive, to give life, to quicken. So, who's the one that gives life and revitalizes? It's the one that made life in the very beginning, it's Yahweh. So this person is really going to be Yahweh himself, the same one that bought Lot out of, out of Sodom and rained fire and brimstone from God out of heaven. 
from Yahweh out of heaven. The same one that basically led Moses and Noah to build the ark and then shut the door at the ark and then caused it to rain and basically brought judgment upon the earth that he did that with Lot and Sodom. Lot, excuse me, Noah and Lot. So this one that this son of man that's revealed in, in the latter day is this quickening spirit person right here. He's the one that's revealed. All right. He, this is the one that's gonna be revealed. Now, Satan don't want you to know this. Remember, he deceived the whole world. So how does he do it? He basically gets false teachers to teach about Jesus coming back. Oh, yeah. Satan is in the church screaming and talking about Jesus is coming back too. Yes, he is. Satan is evil. <laughs> He's in the church talking about and preaching Jesus is coming back. He's preaching the second coming of Christ. He got most people believing that the first thing that happens is Jesus comes back. But you don't see that in the book of Daniel. The first thing we see that happens is ancient of days come. Then we see Yahweh coming and being fought before the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 7. Why is nobody talking about this? It's because Satan has deceived the whole world. Satan would not have you to believe that, you, that this person is coming is Yahweh himself. He don't want you to believe that. Let me go here to 2 Thessalonians. When we're talking about the Antichrist coming, all right, and I was speaking about this a little earlier. I said I probably would go to that in a second or two. So we're going to let's go there real quick. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's check out this Antichrist as, in regards to this quickening spirit person. That's really Yahweh. What's going on there? All right. What's going on there? Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let no man deceive you. Check 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except that come a fall on the word first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That word perdition means destruction. All right. So what happens when Satan is kicked out of heaven? The dragon is kicked out of heaven. He comes down here immediately and he possesses this man of sin. He already has him ready. But he possesses him. I think that's the Greek 684. It means destruction, perdition. Presumed ruin or loss, physical, spiritual, damnation, destruction. All right, son of destruction. I think there's a movie out now. I want to see it called Oppenheimer. All right, about creation of the nuclear, the, the atom bomb. I want to see that. I saw the special on TV the other day about Oppenheimer, that he's the son of destruction, this man of sin. I'm not saying Oppenheimer is a man of sin, the son of destruction. I'm not saying he isn't either. I'm not saying either way. That's not my topic at the moment. All right. The man of, the man of sin be revealed. So you got two people being revealed in the latter days. You got the man of sin that's going to be revealed. And then you got the son of man which is, the, which is the, the man that's going to become a quickening spirit, which is Yahweh, is going to be revealed in the latter day. All right. And I will say the man, the man that's going to, the, the, the quickening spirit, Yahweh, man, is going to be revealed before this man is sin. Now, why do I say that? Because what happens is when, when the man, the quickening spirit, Yahweh, is revealed, he's going to be caught up to God in heaven eventually. He's going to sin, like Psalm 47 said. When he ascends, he's going to kick Satan out of heaven. What happens when Satan is kicked out of heaven? The dragon. He comes down here, possessing this, possesses this man of sin, and he's going to be destructive because he knows that his time is short. He's going to have a lot of destruction in his heart because he wants to destroy everything because his time is short. That's why I say the, man of, the, the son of man that's in the latter day, the man that's going to become the quickening spirit, Yahweh himself, the Almighty, is going to be caught up first into heaven and is going to kick the dragon out of there. All right, we're going to use Michael and his angels to kick the dragon out of heaven. When that happens, the, the angel says, woe unto you that dwell on earth, for the devil's come down on you, having great wrath, for he knows that this time is but short. So he comes down here and possesses this son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God. So basically, 
He comes down here, possesses this man, and causes this man to pose and exalt himself above this quickening spirit man. So what is Satan doing? He's in churches trying to get Yahweh's child to be exalted above the father. And of course, he's using a white man, the image of a white person to do it. And we know that Yahweh is a man of color, but we won't go into that at the moment. Who opposes and exalts of himself above all that is called God. And it's God that's the quickening spirit is the same color as the person that we see in Revelation chapter four. There's a jasper and a sardine color. With woolly hair in Daniel chapter seven, hair like pure wool. Who opposes and exalts of himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. He's going to oppose and exalt himself above this man that got caught up into the throne, to the heavens. Because this man is called God and he's worshiped. So that he is God, a sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to try to take his place. He's Antichrist. All right. Or a vicar of Christ. That means a replacement of God. Right now, the, the vicar of Christ is the Pope. What the vicar of Christ does, he basically is trying to exalt himself above Christ. At the same time, when saying Christ is God, he's trying to exalt himself above him. He's basically making himself Christ because he's the vicar of Christ. He doesn't, he doesn't deny Christ is God. Christ is, as a matter of fact, he says Christ is God and then puts himself in the place of Christ at the same time. He says Christ is God, the most high, and then places and then says he's the vicar of Christ, which means the replacement of Christ. See that? What happens when he sees the father go up there to heaven and basically take over? When he sees the man that's gonna be the quickening spirit, what happens when that happens? Then he's gonna to wanna to be him too. Then he's gonna exalt himself above him. So let's read that. He will and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he is God, sit up in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So right off the bat, he, right now he wants to be above Christ. As soon as he sees this man that's God, that's really God, He's going to want to be above him. Remember, you're not there when I was yet with you. I told you you stand. Verse 6, and now you know what we're told is that he might be revealed on this time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he now, that's the mystery of iniquity. That means thousands of years ago, that mystery was already working. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Now watch this. We're going to use these words to show you what happens and what causes these things to, to come to a complete end. That means... What causes him to really go on a destructive spree, this man of sin? Because remember, all things are going to be calm until the latter end when the Son of Man is revealed. What, what, what does the Son of Man do that causes this man to go off where we are in the Great Tribulation? Well, what we were just talking about, we saw it in, in Revelation chapter 12, that the, that the man child was caught up into God into his throne. And the devil, the dragon was kicked out of heaven. That's what causes it. If it wasn't for that, he would have kept the world going just like it is in a lukewarm state. Revelation chapter three, it speaks about Yah basically wanted that last day church to be hot or cold, not lukewarm. That Satan wants it to be lukewarm. That's where we're at. We're in a lukewarm position. So that Satan won't get kicked into the lake of fire. Because when he now knows he's near, he get kicked into the lake of fire. That's when all troubles at hand. So for the mystery of iniquity that have already worked, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Now watch this. We can use this word right here to show you what's going to happen. Who, who's taken out of the way? It's the one that's letting will let until he be taken out of the way. Who's this one that's letting until he gets taken out of the way? All right. And the word that we're looking for is gnomadi. It's the same word it means to become. Let me see, I think it's 1096, T is taken out of the way. There it is, so yep, then I'm gonna So what happens? What happens? And you can just look at the word, the meaning of these words, even in the Greek, and find out what takes place where this one that's letting will let until he gets taken out of the way. So it's really Yahweh is letting because he's becoming. Now let's look at the meaning of this word, then I'm gonna Along the middle form of a primary verb to cause to be. See that? Let me highlight that. Cause to be. To generate. Just look at these words. Look them up in your dictionary. Generate means to basically 
to become. See, that is perspectively, let me highlight it, to become. Let me make sure I highlight this word. Cause to be generate, what does generate means? To become. So he should be, he would now let it, will let it until he becomes. Come into being, let me highlight the, the few words here. Come into being. Remember she basically was in the process of bringing forth a man child, right? Become, come into being. So basically what's happening is this man child that's being bought by, bought to pass by Israel in her, in her, in her uh, captivity is coming into being. And basically he will let until he comes into being. What happens when he, when he comes into being? He ascends, he goes into heaven. He's caught up into God and to his throne. That's when I said, that a lot of people think that's Yahweh Shai. That happened 2,000 years ago. But remember, when you look at Revelation, the first chapter, said so these are the things that yet to come to pass. That means it hadn't happened yet. That means the woman, the woman that bought up the man child hasn't happened yet, even though Yahweh Shai, it looked like Yahweh Shai. But, but Moses looked like Yahweh Shai too. Yahweh Shai looks like the father. So Yahweh Shai, it happened to him, but it really, he was pointing toward the father that's to be in the latter days. The latter day son of man which is the father so he will he he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way that means till he comes into being what what happens when he comes into being that means he becomes yahweh all right he becomes yahweh so that means there's a time when he's not really yahweh all right there's a time when he doesn't even know who he is because Yah, Yah, Yah kept him secret in Psalm, what is it, Isaiah 49? He kept him secret. He hid him. All right. Let me show you something in Revelation before we, we end this Bible study. Hope you find it as a blessing. But Satan doesn't want you to know this. No, no. Because remember, he wants everything to continue on with one. And I hate to say that this lukewarm to be looking for Yahweh Shai, not waiting on the Father. The Father is the king of the kingdom. No, Yahweh Shai is the king of the kingdom. Oh boy. <laughs> Yahweh Shai is a Melchizedek priest. All right. So when we see the, the, the war called Armageddon, get ready to happen. What happens there? Let's see here. We're gonna look at look for this word thrown on here. All right. When the seventh, when the seventh bowl is released into the air, the seventh vial of wrath is released into the air. Because you got seven bowls of wrath. We can see that the Euphrates drying up in one of the bowls. And we and guess what? Euphrates is dried up and pretty much <laughs> it's really sewn up. But one of these bowls that let me see, where is that at? Hold on just a moment. There it is. And the sixth angel poured out his vow upon the great river Euphrates, and the water there was dried up, and that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's the sixth bowl. What's the happening? How many bowls do we have left to go? One more. So the sixth vow says that the Euphrates be dried, be dried up. Go type in your, your search engine, the Euphrates River, what it looks like right now. It's dried up. So that means there's only one more bowl to be released. That's the seven bowls. What happens when the seven bowl is released? And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there was a great voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, from the throne, see that? Saying it is done. Let's look at that word done. Guess what? What word is that? Genomahi, to become. So in the seventh vow, Yahweh, the quickening spirit, the one that's really Yahweh made in flesh, that becomes a spirit, a quickening spirit, becomes. See that? Tanomahi. To become. 
come into being. Notice what the, the voice came out of that said, it is, it is done. Let me take you there real quick. What does that voice come out of? It comes out of the throne. So who is this that became? He's sitting on the throne in heaven. Let me highlight the whole thing. Voice out of the temple, great voice out of the temple. I'm highlight to make sure you get this and see this if you're not looking at the Bible. A great, out of heaven, great voice out of heaven, out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done. So he's coming, he's sitting on the throne. Who's sitting on the throne? The man child is sitting on the throne up in heaven and said it is done. Okay, from the throne. Not from the midst of the throne, from the throne, sitting on the throne. What happens? He judges the great city Babylon. Because what we got next is Revelation chapter 7, the judgment of Babylon, a great whore. So this is the one that's going to take away the reproach of his people of all the earth. This one that basically is the one that is the, the quickening spirit that raises the dead. He can throw you back into death. He can raise you up and throw you back into hellfire. Oh, my goodness. This is the one. This is the one you all want to play with. This is the one that does good and creates evil. I would take you there, but I'll say that for another Bible study. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and, and, there were, and there came a great voice out of the temple in heaven from the throne saying, it is done. All right. So what, why is all of this trouble going on the, on the earth? Because Satan has been kicked out of heaven. Now, let me say this one more time. The way the world is right now, so in a lukewarm condition, it's neither good nor evil, neither hot nor cold. Satan would keep us there. He would keep us there. All right so that he can reign upon the earth. What is bacteria and all of that stuff reigning? The thriving, lukewarm water. Not cold, no hot. I'm gonna show you <laughs> what Yahawashai said. I remember the fathers in Yahawashai and the, Yahawashai is in the father. And Yahawashai is the lamb of this person, he's the lamb of God. Laodicea, and unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, right? These things say of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So when you, right here, here's Drake. You, can you see that Drake? Yahweh is the beginning of the creation of God. So when you see in Genesis 1, 1, when you read it according to the Hebrew, Bereshit, Bara, Alahayim, Shamaim, Eretz, that means in the beginning, he created Alahayim, the heavens and the earth. The first thing that was created was Yahweh. First thing in all creation that was created was Yahweh, right? How do you know? Because he says it right here. He doesn't lie. What did he call himself? The beginning of the creation of God. What was what, what do you mean the beginning? That means the first thing that was created was Yahweh. That means that tells you that he's not God. He's not God. I, and I, I, like I said, I was one that believed that too. But Satan would have you believe those lies. It's part of basically, you really right there on worshiping the image of the beast. Worshiping the beast. You're worshiping something that's not God. All right? He's the beginning of the creation of God. Yah created him first. And like I said, he put, Yah put him on. He created Yahweh Shai and put him on, and by putting Yahweh Shai on, he created the heavens and the earth. That's why you see it, by him was all things made that was made. 
Without him was not anything made that was made in John chapter one. See that? Without him was not anything. That means Yahweh used him and put him on like a garment, like a vessel, like a temple or a tabernacle. Put him on. He wore Yahweh Shai at the creation and created everything else, created the heavens and the earth with him. But he was Yahweh Shai was the first thing he created and then put him on and created everything else, the heavens and the earth. So let me read that again. These things say if they man, a faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That means he was not God. He was the, he was the beginning, the first thing Yah created. I know thy works and that thou neither hot nor cold, cold nor hot, excuse me. I would that thou were cold, cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now Satan, Satan's doing some work there. He's got the whole church, the body of Christ in the latter day lukewarm. How, is he, how does he got him lukewarm? with false teaching. One of the false teachings, what I just highlighted right here, that Yahweh Shai is God, that he's the most high. That's one of the false teachings. And Satan would have you to believe that about Yahweh Shai, that he is the most high. Because it's a lie. Satan is the father of lies. John 8, what is it, John 8, 44? Saying that Satan is the father of lies, all right? John 8, 44, I think it is. So he would have you to believe that lie that Yahweh Shai is God or Yahweh the Most High. He would have you to believe that. He'd be right there in the church preaching it. Yahweh Shai is God. <laughs> as long as it's a lie, it's cool with him. Because a lie is what's going to promote Satan. But if it's the truth, it's not going to promote him. You know, the whole world's worshiping Yahweh Shai is God. All Christianity is. Something wrong with it, right? I'm telling you, something not right there. Broad is the road and wide is the way to be to destruction and, all, and many there be to go in there, all right? So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou says I am rich and increase with good, okay. Rich and increase with good and have needed nothing. And that's what got, that's what, this is another thing got most people lukewarm. Because thou says I'm rich and increase with goods. Have need of nothing, knows not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye saw, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Don't argue with Yahweh Shai about this. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come in with. To him and sup with him and you with me. All right. To him that overcometh, where I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with him, my father in his throne. So who is this right here? That overcometh and, and sits down with Yahweh in his throne, even as he overcame and sat down with the Father in his throne. That's the Father, the one, the one that's the ancient of the days, the one that becomes a quickening spirit. He's going to be in the church, especially this latter day church right here, Leo the Sea. That Satan wants to keep lukewarm, not hot or cold. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? All right. Even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. What throne does Yahweh have? Yeah. He has he purchased with his blood the throne of David. But remember, Yahweh is coming out of uh, what is it called? Jeconiah, which Yahweh put a curse on him and on his seed after him. That no man of his seed will sit upon the throne of David and prosper. So the only way that Yahweh can sit upon that throne and prosper is the Father sits upon that throne. Why? Because it's the Father's throne in the first place. Was, all right? The throne of Yahweh in Jerusalem is what it's called in the Old Testament. So Yahweh Shai purchased the throne. So it's possible, but he would not prosper on the throne. So how would he prosper? The Father. The one that's the quickening spirit would come down and sit up on the throne with, with Yahweh. All right. That's how that's how it works. Because it's his throne, the throne of Yahweh in Jerusalem. The throne that's in Jerusalem that David sat on is Yahweh's. Yahweh's throne. Yahweh can sit on that throne and prosper. So can if, if Yahweh sitting on that throne with Yahweh Shai, who's a, a descendant of Jeconiah. Yahweh Shai will prosper. That's what he's waiting on. He's waiting on Yahweh to finish his work. 
and then I think it, let me, it's gonna be my last verse. It says that Yahweh will be doing a short work upon the earth. I think it's gonna be somewhere around three and a half years. Let's see, let's go there real quick. I'm gonna do a short work. Part of it is gonna be what we see in second Ezra chapter 13, fourth Ezra chapter 13, certain Bibles. And my, I got a Bible that has it in fourth Ezra instead of second Ezra. Okay, let's see real quick. I'm gonna try to search this out real fast. Hold on just a moment. Romans 9, 28. So a lot of the epistles, like Paul and all of that, wrote about this Yahweh coming down. He knew what was going on. When we was to sit and talk to Paul, and he was still in the earth today, he basically be saying, man, y'all y'all don't know Yahweh's coming? That's all I wrote in there in, that, in, that, in those epistles. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because the short work will Yahweh make up on the earth. Let's, let's see. Romans 9, 27 says, Isaiah, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel, he is the sin of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So the, the number of the children of Israel is going to be at the sand of the sea, but only a remnant shall be saved. For, he's, for he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will Yahweh make up on the earth. I think it's going to be like once he becomes Yahweh, who he is, or once he overcomes death, put it that way. I think death got to be overcome first. Once he overcomes death, he's going to be like an Elijah the prophet. And I think he does say that I'm seeing Elijah the prophet. And he's talking about the spirit of Elijah is going to be in this person that we're going to see as Yahweh. The spirit of Elijah is going to be on. All right. Behold, I've seen Elijah prophet for the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And you should turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. So basically, he, right, he overcomes death. He's in the earth. They start fighting against him. He's like a prophet for his people. He's gathering his people. They start fighting against him, and he destroys the nations. As we see in 2nd Ezra chapter 13, he destroys them. But before he destroys them, he ascends into heaven. All right, he ascends into heaven. And that's going to be after the three and a half years. How long is he going to stay in the heavens? I would say another three and a half years. But when he comes, he's going to take the church out. The body of Christ is going to basically uh, give people life. He's a quickening spirit. He's going to quicken people to life that are dead. The saints, he's going to quicken the church, the body of Christ. The, 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 the scripture says the Ahawa will descend from heaven. Notice it doesn't say the Lord Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with a, with a shout. It says Yahweh will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ, shall rise first. They that are they, they that are uh, that are still yet alive shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye. That's First Thessalonians chapter four. It doesn't say Yahweh is going to descend from heaven. It says Yahweh will descend from heaven with a shout. Remember, he 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 said he will descend from heaven with a shout. In Psalm forty-seven, it says he ascends into heaven with a shout, with the voice of the, you know with a trumpet. That word shout means to rule, the trumpet. He descends and comes back down with a shout, sound of a trumpet. He goes into heaven with the sound of a trumpet, he comes back with the sound of a trumpet. But when he comes back, he's raising the dead, he's quickening the dead. Those that are still alive, he's giving them eternal bodies. So, Second Ezra is really ch chapter 13, it's really basically got it all in a nutshell there. It's, it's, it's in a it's in a, uh, how can I put it? It's in a parable form, but it's right there. And he, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will Yahweh make up on the earth.
key word is ganomahi, which means he will become. One more place. Remember, he put on Yahweh to create everything. And we see that this manifestation in Revelation chapter one is basically him putting on Yahweh. I'm gonna prove it to you. Watch this. They're both speaking in one, one of these verses. They do it in the, at the beginning of the, of the book of Revelation, they do it at the end. Revelation 1 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is that speaking? It's in red. That's Yahweh Shem. Let me highlight it. I like the whole verse if I can, if it doesn't take away from the real word. Because the red, whenever you read the scriptures and you see writings in red, that's supposed to be Yahweh All right. Hold on just a moment. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Hold on. Make sure that you see what I'm what I'm highlighting. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All right. So Yahweh Shai has a beginning and the end. He's Alpha and Omega. All right. Yahweh doesn't have a beginning nor an end. Say it, Yahweh. See that? You notice he didn't say I'm say if Yahweh or, or Jesus Christ, right? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith Yahweh. Whenever you see that word Lord by itself in the New Testament, it's talking about Yahweh. Otherwise, it would say, saith the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read it again. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that's Yahweh, Yahweh Shai speaking. Then it says, saith Yahweh, which is, notice it's in black now, which is, which was, and is to come, the Almighty. The key word there is Almighty right there. All right, Yahweh Shai is not the Almighty. But he's speaking from Yahweh Shai's being. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It's in red. How did, why did they put it in red? Because only Yahweh Shai in this situation would be the beginning and the end. It has beginning, end, and Alpha and Omega. Yahweh does not have a beginning nor an end. He's, he's eternal. Say if Yahweh, basically saying it's not Yahweh Shai, say if Yahweh. Which is, check this out, which is, which was, and which is to come. Which is to come. That means Yahweh is going to come down here like Solomon said. But will God dwell indeed upon the earth? Will God indeed dwell upon the earth? He, which is to come. Which is, which was, and which is to come. Then he says right there, and I'm going to highlight this all by itself so you can see. The Almighty. So Yah put Yahweh Shai on from the very beginning. He did it at the end too. He created him and put him on. And Yahweh Shai asked him that he would do that too. In John chapter 17. Yahweh Shai prayed. When he prayed that prayer in John 17, he asked that Yah would glorify him with his, with his own self, with the glory he had with him from the beginning. So I'm going to highlight this right here. The Almighty. Who is the Almighty? El Elyon, the Most High. Is that Yahweh Shai? No. That's a mistake I had. The devil had me deceived too. One more scripture. Make sure you get this, this real serious point. Like I just said, I don't want to quote a scripture and I can't pull up and bring it up and show you where it's at. But Yahweh Shai prayed that Yahweh would do it. Yahweh would do that to him. What did he pray at? John 17. John 17, verse 5. And now, O oh Father, I'm going to highlight it so you can see where it's at. And give you, you give people, especially the devil's children, no excuse. The devil has children too, yo. Yes, he does. He has people. All right, so to give him no opportunity. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Let me read that again. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
So what did Yahweh do in the beginning, John, in Genesis chapter one, verse one? He created Allah And then he put him on and created everything else. So what we just saw in Revelation chapter one, we saw Yahweh speaking from the voice in the body of Yahweh Shai. He put Yahweh Shai on right there. He did it in the Old Testament in Genesis. He did it in the last book of Revelation. Put Yahweh Shai on. I hope you're getting this. I hope you understand it. I pray your understanding is open by the Holy Spirit of Yahweh. That he bless you with this. That it becomes a blessing unto you. That you can see the blessing that's in Yahweh coming down. That there would be no haters of the Father as there was always throughout history among our people. All right. That you would be glorified with the Father. I pray that in Yahweh Shai Mashiach's name. Amen. All right, everybody. If you want to study this again some more, like I said, I I get a I get a kick out of this what Yahweh has given me to study. All right, and to teach. When I was filled with the spirit, there was a man standing there, and he was older than Yahweh Shai. And uh and I knew it was Yahweh himself. But I didn't know how it was. But I was filled with the Holy Spirit and got a revelation from Yahweh about the man that's coming. Did I see him? Yes, I saw him. I've been seeing him all along. All right. I've been seeing this man all along. But I'm going to let you go for right now. We'll see you next week, if y'all willing, for us to see you next week. Bye, Shami. Amen.